Hey guys, welcome to part 3 of what if Naruto became heir to the demon of Kirigakure if you enjoy the video then like share and subscribe as it inspires me to make more such videos also check out my other playlist hope you would like them too. So let's get started. Chapter 7 Eyes Like Mine Naruto and Anko stood before the third Hokage, the older of the two filled with a giddy sense of hope while the other was left with curiosity. After all, what would it mean for his training if the elderly leader said no to Anko's request? I suppose I could always go back to my original methods, but increase the intensity this time around, the blonde rationalized. But I honestly don't want it to come to that, I'm actually a little hopeful the old man says yes, just so I can have some time outside the village if nothing else. As if reading the young genin's thoughts the Sarutobi clan head pulled his pipe away, and finally answered the purple-haired Jounin's request. Before I even think of agreeing to this, I want you to explain the reason you've chosen Naruto out of all the genin who, not just made it to the finals, but also reside within the village. What makes him so special? Seeing her Hokage so serious cooled Anko's eager mood, and as she settled down and stood straight, the beautiful woman answered the white-robed man that sat before her. For starters Hokage-sama I owe him a debt during my run-in with Orochimaru I was incapacitated and rather than leave me there to chase him, young Uzumaki stayed behind and made sure I arrived at the tower safely. I can't possibly let something like that go, not when I know the number of genin willing to perform such an act is something I believe I could count on one hand. But, aside from that after hearing his report back at the tower and seeing him in action during the preliminaries I feel that Naruto as a Maki has an unrivaled amount of potential that has yet to fully be explored. And I'd like to be the first person to try. Hiruzen gave his subordinate a curious gaze as he asked her how she felt about the young boy's time under Kakashi. Are you saying he hasn't already done a good job in tapping into this unrivaled potential? Of course not Hokage-sama and Ko immediately replied. I meant no offense to my fellow Leaf Shinobi. All I was trying to say is that much of the boy's training has been in brute force, and although using three affinities at his age is impressive I feel that Naruto Izumaki should be instructed in the subtle arts of our profession along with the loud. And you believe yourself to be the ideal teacher. It wasn't a question. Here's Ansar Tobi knew that Anko never did anything without being sure first it was why she had never bothered to chose any students as she had not met any that made her certain that they would succeed under her care. The woman's shrewd mind and passionate words made Hiruzen feel more secure about placing Naruto in her care. Very well then, I grant you permission to be his temporary instructor. Once the finals are over, if he is not promoted to Chunin, he will once again be assigned to Team 7 and placed under the care of Kakashi. Anko's face split into a wide happy grin. One that stretched so far that her warm brown eyes were forced to close giving her the impression of a kid in a candy store. Bowing low she thanked her Hokage before coming back up and inquiring about her mission. So does this mean I can take him with me to the land of sea? This threw Hiruzen for a loop, the smoke he just sucked down from his pipe catching in his lungs from the shock. Sputtering through a coughing fit the elderly cage gave his subordinate a very watery stare of disbelief. W what? Anko didn't you just get me to agree to letting you train Naruto for the month? I thought you would want a reduction in missions during this time not more. Anko gave the old fire shadow a rapid shake of her head to indicate that wasn't the case. Of course I still want the mission Lord Hokage, it's imperative to my teaching style, I want the kid to see what I intend to teach him in action, so he'll see how it's applied in a real life situation. I don't want to just have him learn and practice something in a field, then take it into the real world blindly, I want him to truly understand what it means to be a shinobi. And that includes the assassination aspect of the job too. This bit of information made Naruto turn sharply in his temporary sensei's direction. Assassination? What kind of mission was Anko trying to get him into? The head of the Sarutobi clan saw this and asked Anko if she was serious. He's only 13 years old, what makes you think he's ready for assassination? He tore a hole right through that sound genin in the very first match of the preliminaries didn't he? What's wrong with having him experience the art of silent killing too? Because in the case of assassination the target is generally asleep unarmed or otherwise unaware of the act. Naruto's kill was during a match against someone who was trying to kill him, it's completely different. Anko's gaze hardened a little. She wasn't going to budge. 
That doesn't change the fact that Naruto is a Maki, is a shinobi, a ninja. He will at some point in his career perform an assassination, why not now? I went on my first mission when I was only a year older than him minus. But those were different times, Hirizen cut her off. The number of needed assassinations has dropped significantly since you were a genin anko, and the few that are needed now usually get done by my ambi members. I gave this one to you because of the delicate subject it involved, and the hope that it would help with your memory. Curious about it, but choosing to ignore the bit about Anko's memory, Naruto rose his hand as an indicator her wish to speak. When his Hokage acknowledged him the blonde pleaded his new sensei's case as well. Actually old man, I'm okay with being sent on the mission with Anko sensei. In case you forgot, I do still intend to take that hat from you someday and what kind of Hokage would I be if I was unable to relate and be open to discuss an assassination with one of my subordinates. You know of the dangers and psychological damage due to performing them yourself, so you are able to be a sort of counsel for those you send out. Should an aspiring cage not need the same ability? Hearing the younger shinobi's words, and the level of seriousness laced with every word, made the elderly Hokage proud. The Naruto in front of him was nothing like the one from his academy days. The young genin that stood before him was a true, budding ninja one that he felt was worth being given this chance. Very well then, Hirizen relented while steepling his fingers, I'll allow you to take Genin Izumaki on this mission Anko. But only because I trust your ability to bring him back alive, if you return to the village without him, or his career is brought to an end by this in any other way then be prepared to hand over your headband. Anko nodded firmly, her usual lackadaisical attitude switched off in the face of this condition. Seeing that his subordinate understood the elderly Hokage began to relay the mission specs to both Anko and Naruto. Alright then, now that we've got that settled let's get on with it. Jounin Anko Midarashi and Genin Naruto Azumaki your mission is an A- ranked assassination mission. Your target is a man that goes solely by the name Amachi. The target resides in the land of sea and is reported to be a scientist under the employ of Orochimaru. His heinous crimes against humanity, through way of his experiments, have caused the abduction and disappearance of over 30 people. Your primary mission is the assassination of this individual, however, if possible you are to collect and return with as much of this man's notes as possible. Anything we can use against Orochimaru in the future is information too valuable to ignore. Once he finished explaining their objectives Anko and her blonde pseudo-student gave silent confirmation that they accepted the mission. From there the elderly shinobi handed them the file to go over before dismissing them. XXX. Naruto walked from his apartment towards the main gate of the village. Anko had instructed him to do a double check to make sure he'd had everything necessary for their mission. She told him to think hard because while something may seem trivial, like say a pack of explosive tags, you never know what you'll find on a mission, and that I don't need a thought could cause major casualties. So, the blonde made sure to go over everything he had at home and pack whatever tools he might need. Once he finished Naruto found himself walking the back roads towards the gate where he'd be meeting Anko his reason being that using this route gave him time to think without risking bumping into anyone he knew. And thinking was something the blonde felt was needed to plan out his next steps. Because, while he had chosen to take up Zappos's mantle and ultimately surpass the man was that it? Was that all there was going to be to his ninja career? Naruto felt his eyes itch with the desire to turn and look back at the Hokage monument to be reminded of his original goal in life. Did he still want that? If he was being honest with himself? Yes. In spite of his promise to the dead demon of Kiri Naruto never actually let go of his first dream, all that changed was his reason for wanting the hat. His time with Haku helped open his eyes to the truth, he didn't need the acknowledgement from every person in the village, no, he just needed the love of those he held close. It was for them that he would get stronger, and become the Hokage, so that he'd be better able to protect those he considered precious. The only thing was, Naruto could probably count on both hands who that list included. And for a moment, it made the young Izumaki wonder if his strength would be enough to make his dream come true. No, Naruto shook his head in denial, I'm just being hard on myself again. Haku only had Zabuza, and he was able to get so strong protecting just him, but even still I'm taking his words the wrong way. 
It's not about the number of people, it's the principle. I've got to remember that, I can't ever forget, or think less of my precious people like that again. I'll get stronger for them, and become the next Hokage so I'll be better able to protect them it's my promise to them and myself. By the end of his declaration Naruto, noticed he'd made it to the meeting spot. His blue eye scanned the area in search of his temporary sensei, and he felt annoyance build up inside at not finding the woman anywhere nearby. Oh come on he complained, don't tell me all jowning are late. I was hoping it was just Kakashi sensei, but I guess I was wrong. He crossed his arms in frustration as he muttered, if I would have known about this earlier I would have stopped and had some ramen at least. But then you'd be late my little hatchling, and that would have been a terrible impression to make on your first mission with me. The voice came from seemingly everywhere at once, and Naruto snapped his head up to search for the source. It was Anko's voice of that the blonde had no doubt, but he couldn't pinpoint the older woman's position. Anko obviously saw his fruitless search though because she laughed from her position before standing up from her place by the guard post to show that she had been there the whole time. Naruto's eyes widened at this realization because it meant that, had she been an enemy, he would have been dead. So this is another difference between a genin and a jounin, those guys in the forest were pretty easy to sniff out, but you, I couldn't even hear you breath. I know, but that's a nice little trick you've got there hackling. There aren't very many ninja who think to do what you did trying to find me. Or rather, they can't focus their chakra that way. Anko explained, but when she saw the light that began to glint in her pseudo student's eye she decided to bring the genin back to reality. Gotta remember he's still a kid, despite his talent, she thought before moving to speak again. But don't let that go to your head kid, because just as you saw, you haven't even mastered that skill yet and I could have easily slit your throat without you ever even knowing. There's still a long way for you to go before you're down in level, but, I'll make sure that by the end of the month you're going to be tuned in level without a doubt. While initially a bit let down by her assessment Naruto perked up at hearing the beautiful woman say that she wasn't going to give up on him and better yet, she was going to make him a tune in. In spite of himself Naruto couldn't help imagining the way it'd feel wearing the flak jacket that signified he was no longer a genin. His thoughts were cut short when Anko tapped him on the head and said, and now that lesson one is over, it's time we get going my little hatchling. We wouldn't want our target moving and getting away now would we? Naruto shook his head and rubbed the spot the older woman had caused to itch before he began to follow her surprisingly. They were running through the trees. We're tree hopping. Usually when my squad has a mission we don't rush it. Anko looked beside her to the blonde youth she'd taken under her wing and explained that. That's because his team had been doing escort missions and glorified errands. This is an assassination, a real life mission with a time frame. We need to get there as soon as possible, which means there's no time for sightseeing. Naruto pondered his for a moment before decided she had a point before remembering another thing he was curious about. Why are you calling me hatchling? At this Anko gave the younger shinobi a playful pout. What? Can't I give my student a nickname? I'm sure Kakashi does it too. Or do you just not like me? When Anko turned her head away and pretended to start crying Naruto could feel his head drop in disbelief. Sometimes it was hard to remember Anko was a jounin. And no, it's nothing like that Anko sensei, I was just curious is all. You see Kakashi sensei doesn't actually give us nicknames, so it's new to me. I I really don't mind the name honest. Really? Anko's face whipped back around with a ridiculous, obviously fake, hopeful expression. Why yeah? Really? Maybe it's not too late to turn around and forget this whole thing, Naruto thought as he listened to the woman beside him laugh at his annoyed face. While Naruto was on his way to aid in his first assassination, Many of his fellow genin were busy with their own kind of training. At the Hugo compound Hinata stood before her father, Hayashi, in the man's study. He was looking over a series of papers, while his eldest daughter waited for him to address her. After making the young girl wait for five minutes, and seeing she wasn't going to break down in nervousness, Hayashi asked what the girl wanted. F father I. I wish to ask for you to resume instructing me in our gentle fist. She answered with a bow. I've managed to make it through the preliminaries of the Chunin selection exams, and wish to represent our family properly during the finals. 
A minus as acting heiress, I feel that anything less than perfection is unacceptable to present to the many foreign prospects coming to our village. I ask this, not as your daughter, but as the next head of our family. Help me to not embarrass then Hugo clan. Hayashi sat and stared at his daughter. Internally he felt surprise at the young girl's words as he knew Hinata to be terribly shy and usually his daughter couldn't speak more than two or three words to him. Where did this come from? And then there's her words, she's deliberately pointing out her flaws, but Hinata's bringing them up in such a way that she's letting me know she doesn't wish to project those weakness during the finals. It was these points that helped the Hugo clan leader make his decision. Very well Hinata, I will resume your training. However, I reserve the right to pull out of this arrangement if I feel you aren't making enough progress within a reasonable time. Years of living in the compound helped the young heiress hide her joy at her father's words, and instead just replied with a bow and quiet thank you. Although her pearl-like eyes widened when her father said they were going to start now. But Hinata wasn't the only one in Konoha who was gearing up for the finals. On the other end of the village, far from the clan compounds, and hidden among the homes of average civilians, Ten Ten could be found in her backyard staring down a man equal in height to Haishi. And in the man's daughter's opinion, equal in prowess as well. His name was Sanosuke Sagara, he was Ten Ten's father, and a skilled swordsman. Like Naruto the man used a large style weapon, but instead of a broadsword, Sanosuke wielded a Zanbito. However, the sword's immense weight did nothing to impede his ability with the weapon, as demonstrated by the way he easily blocked his daughter's diagonal swing. You'll need to do better than that if you want to have any hopes of beating that Izumaki kid, at least from the things you've told me anyway. Sanosuke instructed before pushing Ten Ten back and using his Zambito as a springboard so he could switch into an aerial kick. He was proud when the bun-haired girl managed to dodge it, but frowned when she immediately charged back in wrong. Sanosuke alerted his daughter before planting both feet into her chest with a double kick. As his daughter lay gasping for breath, the former mercenary explained what she had done wrong. You need to stop rushing things 10-10, don't always be so prone to act first. It's okay to take time and move away from your opponent to strategize, if you don't, and all you do is attack you become predictable. And from what I understand, predictability in your line of work gets you killed right? The man's daughter hung her head in shame. He was right, she was acting foolish. But that's what this is all for the weapon mistress thought as she hauled herself to her feet for round two, so that I can fix the mistakes that caused me to lose out to Naruto in the first place. Smiling as she thought of facing the blonde again in the finals 10-10 readied herself for her father's next attack. And it wasn't just the Kunoichi who were busy training either. Miles away from the village Sasuke Achiha was desperately trying to dodge Kakashi's fierce Taijutsu assault. They had tried reactivating the inverted eye that the young Genin had used against Kiba, but were unsuccessful so instead they worked to get Sasks used to not only his lack of vision, but also working to increase the boy's speed. You're going to need to be even faster than Lee if you hope to stand any chance against Gara in the finals. Kakashi had told him. Because when this month is over, if you haven't at least managed to match his speed then you will die. As he got hit by another kick to the chest Sasuke felt his anger, but also his resolve strengthen. He would surpass Lee, he would defeat Gara, and then he would use his newfound strength to help him reach his goal. He would make Itachi pay, no matter what it took, or where he was forced to go, Sasuke would avenge his mother's death. XXX. It took them most of the first day, but Naruto and Anko managed to reach the closest port before nightfall. But where Naruto thought they would now wait and rest, his temporary sensei proved him wrong again. Nope, the snake mistress said with a shake of her head, we're boarding tonight so that we'll be there by morning. But Kakashi sensei didn't minus. Kakashi wasn't taking you guys on real missions Gaki, you had time to rest. But when you're with me, you better be ready to play hardball because I guarantee there's gonna be nights where we won't even sleep. Naruto saw the series look in Anko's pupil-less brown eyes and it made him realize that there was a reason such high-ranking missions were safe for Jounin level and above Shinobi. They weren't just dangerous, but taxing on the body as well, something no ordinary genin would be able to handle. But Zabuza wasn't an ordinary genin, and if I'm going to honor him then I can't afford to be either. 
Looking back at Anko the blonde could see that she was waiting to see what he'd do. With his head on straight again, Naruto nodded firmly as a signal he was ready. This brought a smile to the woman's face as she lead him to where they would purchase their tickets for the boat. And even though the boy had hesitated a moment ago, Anko had no doubt in her mind he would continue the mission. She'd chosen right, now she just had to hope he'd be able to be there when it mattered. I guess I'll start by teaching him the striking shadow snake while we wait to dock again. The woman thought as they made their way to their ride. Because something told Anko this mission wasn't going to turn out anything like she planned. Soft, light brown eyes shot open as years of instinct took over. As a shinobi who often took dangerous missions on foreign soil, Anko Midarashi had learned to be a light sleeper. And that's why when she heard the floorboards creak outside her cabin door, the woman was out of bed and against the wall with a kunai in hand waiting to see if they would finally make their move. This is the third time since we left the port, Anko thought as she steadied her breathing. Whoever it is has stopped in front of my room each time, just to leave after standing there for ten minutes. To Anko, she believed Naruto and her had been tagged early on in their mission, right before, or as they bought their ferry tickets. She believed that their assassination target had expected their imminent arrival, and had planned to have his pursuers killed off before they got to him. Well good luck trying to get rid of me, the snake mistress growled internally, because there's no way I'm letting anybody get in my way on this mission. Having had enough of the waiting game, Anko steeled her conviction and shouldered down her door. She could hear the person on the opposite side gasp in surprise, clearly caught off guard, and she felt warm skin under her fingers as she slammed them against the hallway wall. But just before Anko could deliver a killing blow, she heard a familiar voice yell out for her to stop. Wait, Sensei, it's me. Brown met blue as Sensei and student locked eyes, and for a moment everything stopped. Neither Shinobi even realized they'd stopped breathing. Finally though, Anko's brain registered that she wasn't in any danger, and she let Naruto drop to the floor. Relaxing her shoulders just slightly, in case the blonde before her was really an imposter, Anko eyed the boy on the floor and asked what he was doing. And has it been you, I've felt standing outside my door? Naruto for his part just turned his eyes away, unable to look his temporary teacher in the eye as he shook his head yes. Why? Was Anko's simple and yet complicated question. Complicated because the genin at her feet didn't really know how to answer her. Naruto didn't think he'd be having this conversation with anyone, let alone the woman in front of him, but the past few nights had just been so hard. I I can't sleep. It was only three little words, words parents heard all the time from their children. But for Anko it resonated deep down to her core and pushed forth a memory she'd kept locked away. One where a young girl a little younger than Naruto stood before her own sensei and whispered those very same words. A memory where that sensei still kind and understanding, wrapped his charge in his arms and comforted a young Anko who was feeling scared after her first kill. And, without meaning to, Anko found herself repeating those same words to her own student. It doesn't make you a monster Naruto. In fact, just by the way your kills are bothering you shows how human you are. It's only when you feel nothing for the lives of others that you become a monster. Naruto still looked away as he replied, but I took their lives so easily, I, I didn't even think about it. I just did what my instincts said, and I killed those guys. The blonde on the floor heard the boards creak so he turned his head, only to find that Anko had knelt down so they were eye to eye, a hole Naruto found he couldn't break. Not even when she placed her hand on his head and ran her fingers through his hair. And if you hadn't done those things, if you hadn't killed them, then they would have killed you. Difference is they would have enjoyed it, those guys were the monsters Naruto, you're just a ninja trying to stay alive. But even as she said this and Naruto felt some of his guilt wash away, he couldn't help thinking about his desire to honor Zabuza. And for the first time, he really questioned whether or not he could do it. XXX. And Naruto wasn't the only one suffering from an emotional storm. Back in Konoha, Kiba Inuzuka couldn't sleep either. Tossing and turning in his bed. The shaggy-haired Jenin just couldn't get comfortable. It was either too hot, too cold or something itched like crazy until finally Kiba just gave up and got out of bed. Leaving his room, the Inuzuka walked the hall that led to the bathroom and flipped on the light. 
What he saw in the mirror didn't surprise him. In fact, he'd been expecting it. His hair like all in Uzuka grew fast and now was a wild mess down to his shoulders. His eyes were bloodshot and drooped from lack of sleep. Reaching a clawed hand up, the brunette scratched an itch in his tangled mane. Only to stop and stare at his hand. Seeing those claws reminded him of why he couldn't sleep. Akamaru. His best friend, his companion, his familiar was dead. No, Kiba growled low in his throat, not dead. That bastard Achiha killed him. He murdered my best friend in cold blood. A lack of sleep and pain from Akamaru's death clouded Kiba's mind, leaving him in a fog of rage. One only made stronger by memories of the meeting his mother had held with the Hokage about the incident. By law, there was nothing that could be done. Killing was allowed during the Chunin exams, and every participant signed a waiver stating they understood death was a possibility, even Akamaru. The pup's paw print was stamped right beside Kiba's own handwriting. The only thing the Hokage could really do was offer reparations in the form of payment. Something Kiba vehemently refused, as no amount of money would replace what he'd lost, or return a Kamaru to him. No, Kiba knew there was only one thing that would satisfy him now. And as he stared at his reflection in the mirror, and watched as his eyes turned to slits, he thought about how good revenge was going to feel. Sasuke Uchiha was going to pay. XXX. The morning after their talk, Naruto and Anko found themselves seated in her room talking about how to continue the blonde's training, in this case summoning. It's a rare and useful tool, Anko started, something not many shinobi are capable of that could give you the advantage you need during a fight. I myself use snakes. Like Orochimari? Naruto questioned. Yes, but only because it was the contract he chose to sign. Not saying that I don't love being able to summon snakes, but now they've gotten a bad reputation for being his signature, so I try not to do it too often. Something she said caught the blonde's attention. Wait, contract. Well yeah, Anko looked at her student funny, how else did you think it was done? Naruto quirked an eyebrow as he answered her. I thought it had something to do with changing your chakra to look like an animal, I didn't think it was as easy as signing a piece of paper. The blonde's response got an unexpected reaction from Anko. She laughed. She laughed for a few minutes before finally calming down, and when she did, the ponytailed Kunoichi saw the confused look her pseudo student was giving her. So, Anko decided to answer Naruto's unasked question. Sorry about that, Gaki. It's just hearing you say summoning is easy was more than I could take. In fact, if anything, summoning is one of the hardest skills to master. But, why? Anko just sat back and smirked before rolling up her sleeve. With her arm revealed, not only did Naruto's eyes get a glimpse of her unexpectedly smooth skin, but he also noticed the tattoo that was painted on her forearm. It was a snake wrapped around a side. This was given to me on the day I proved myself to the snake summons. They bit me here at this Anko showed Naruto the tips of the snake's fangs. There were two puncture scars. And the venom burned this into my skin from the inside. Naruto cringed at the thought, but couldn't help be intrigued about one thing. You said you had to prove yourself? What did you mean by that? I had to show the snake boss, Manda that I was worthy to be his summoner. Was Anko's reply. But there was something about this darkness that flashed in Anko's eye as the Kunoichi spoke that made Naruto ask, and how did you do that? What did this Manda have you do? At this, Anko's shoulders slumped in a tired motion, as if she'd just gotten done carrying a heavy load for miles. This was more than enough for Naruto to realize, whatever it was, Anko wasn't proud of it. And this made him pull back. Or, if it's uncomfortable, you don't have to minus. No, Anko cut him off, it's okay. If we're gonna do this I. I have to open up a little too. When Orochimaru had me sign the snake contract, Manda's personal test was to have me bring him a hundred sacrifices. And then I had to watch as he ate them. This news shocked Naruto, and he looked on at Anko in sympathy. He couldn't imagine having to go through something so terrible, having to listen to all those screams and pleas for mercy. Just as he was about to reach over to take her hand though she spoke again. It was one of the worst sights I've ever seen, there was so much blood. 
but after it was over I was allowed to summon any snake on the contract other than Manda. Although I never would even if I could. After hearing what this Manda's test was Naruto shuddered to think of what kind of damage such a monster would do once unleashed. This thought process resulted in another question springing from the blonde shinobi's lips. So am I right in guessing, you aren't going to have me sign the same contact as you? Anko answered him with a shake of her head. Nah. At least not now that I'm remembering when I signed it. I mean, before we boarded the boat, I'd thought of having you sign it. But I wouldn't feel right putting you through that. Then why all this talk about summoning? Naruto questioned with a quirked eyebrow. His answer was a smack to the head. Anko eyed the smart mouth blonde before growling out. Maybe because I thought it'd be a good lesson for you to learn Gaki. Ouch. Naruto grunted in pain before sending Anko an irritated look. Well, if you aren't gonna teach me summoning what am I going to learn? At this the blonde's temporary sensei leaned back against the wall and casually crossed her arms yet even in her usual trench coat. It was easy for Naruto to notice the way the woman's arms pushed out her chest something the blonde youth's budding hormones were excited for. And that was something Anko noticed. Smirking like her namesake, Anko leaned forward and I'd her pseudo-student. Well, maybe I can start by teaching you the look and turn. This is the second time I've caught you staring, and I'm starting to wonder if there's something here you like. Her teasing snapped Naruto out of his trance, and as he turned his eyes up from her tempting cleavage, the Uzumaki boy could feel his cheeks heating up from the embarrassment. Shaking his head to rid himself of any impure thoughts, Naruto fumbled past his tongue to offer a reply. And no, that's okay, I don't need it. A minus and I'm sorry, I it's just that. Um well. But Anko waved him off and relaxed her posture. This had the effect of letting up on the pressure to her chest. Smirking at Naruto good naturedly she said, I was only kidding. Actually, with the whole summoning thing going out the window for now I suppose I can teach you something a little simpler. How does a new stealth technique sound? This got Naruto's attention. What kind of technique? It's called the chameleon shadow, and it allows the user to become invisible for as long as they copper by the chakra, a pretty good option for someone like you, but someone with a powerful dajutsu or great enough tracker ability will still be able to find you. As she finished her explanation of what the move was Anko could tell her temporary student was indeed interested. On his end, Naruto was already coming up with an interesting combo he could make with a technique like that, and couldn't wait to learn it so he could try it out. One thing's for sure, it would make infiltration a whole lot easier, he thought with an air of excitement about him. Eager to get started, the young blonde leaned forward a bit and asked when she was going to start teaching him. After breakfast, the female shinobi answered, you can't learn on an empty stomach, and I won't be able to focus until I get a bite in me. While at first Naruto was going to protest as he wanted to get started as soon as possible, any argument was silenced by the loud rumbling of his stomach. Laughing sheepishly, the young Izumaki let his words die on his tongue and motioned for Anko to lead the way. Breakfast was a small affair, considering their budget, and once it was finished the two shinobi were ready for some training. They headed back to Anko's room where she told Naruto this particular training would take place. We can do more once the mission has been completed, and we're on our way back to Konoha. With the importance of this assignment though I'd rather we try to stay a bit more focused, okay? Naruto nodded in understanding as she answered his unasked question. Once back in the privacy of the Jounin's room Anko motioned for her blonde companion to take a seat on the bed, while she herself moved to stand towards the center of the floor. Placing her hands in a ram sign before gathering her chakra for the technique, being as in tuned as she was with her control and her extensive use of the technique, it was only a moment before her body began to fade out of sight. Naruto watched in rapt attention, blue eyes wide with excitement, as his pseudo-sensei vanished right in front of him. That excitement soon turned to anger though when he felt a sharp whack against the back of his head a moment later. Hey! Naruto sputtered. What the hell was that for? Breaking out into laughter, Anko let her technique drop before letting herself calm down. Turning her mirth-filled eyes on her blonde companion though, she answered the angry youth with a bit of wisdom. To get your head out of the clouds Gaki, you were so focused on the technique, that you forgot about me. 
You can't afford to do that out in the field. Naruto, eyed the woman curiously. Can't do what in the field? What did I do? You got distracted by a technique you've never seen before, you can't do that. No matter what you may see out there I need you to keep your head in the game. Was Anko's reply. The blonde genin looked at the jounin with understanding in his eyes, grasping the seriousness of what she told him and filing it away so as to keep from making the same mistake again. His perception did not go unnoticed, and when she saw it, Anko showed the younger shinobi the proper signs used to activate the technique he'd just been shown. Eager to learn Naruto paid close attention, his mind soaking up the lesson like a sponge. The chameleon's shadow was the only technique the Uzumaki had time to learn in the four-day boat ride as the first three were spent going over information they had and making plans for how to accomplish their objective, the termination of a man named Amachi. Anko explained that, since the man worked for Orochimari, there was a good chance they'd run into some very strange, as well as dangerous, characters if they weren't careful. That's why I wanted us to spend so much time going over our action plan and escape routes, the older woman spoke quietly as they walked off the boat. Like I said on board, We'll have more time for skill training once this is over. Naruto just nodded his head in understanding, but before he could bring up another topic of discussion his attention was drawn away by laughter. However, it wasn't a happy kind of laughter, no this was one of cruelty. Something the blonde knew all too well about. Turning his blue eyes in the sound's direction, Naruto felt his anger spark at what he saw. Kids, four of them, were chasing a girl covered in bandages. Their laughter was mingled with harsh words as they pelted the obviously distressed girl with small rocks. Sharp eyes caught sight of the stone that was hidden by the beach sand, and within moments Naruto watched as the girl's foot hit it, causing her to trip. Now, with her face full of dirt, the girl was quickly surrounded by her assailants and forced to suffer further harm as they started to kick her. It was when he heard the girl's cry for help that Naruto snapped. Before Anko could think to stop him, the younger shinobi vanished from her side, only to reappear behind the ring of boys. Not even bothering to say a word of warning, Naruto reached out and gripped the closest shoulder before jerking his arm back and sending that kid stumbling into the dirt in surprise. This got the attention of the other three, and they didn't like what they saw. What the heck did you do that for? One of them yelled out. He grit his teeth in anger at the treatment of his friend, showing off his missing front teeth. Yeah, shouted another wearing a cap, don't you know what that thing is? Hearing how that kid addressed the girl on the ground made Naruto see red. How many times had the same thing been said about him? He wasn't about to stand by and let some sot-nosed punks treat someone else that way, especially not a girl. I don't care who she is, the blonde growled through clenched teeth and making sure to point out that he did not share their choice of category. All I care about is the fact that I see four guys picking on one girl. Now I suggest you apologize before I lose my temper. The smug looks on the boys' faces confirmed the sounds Naruto heard from behind him. So when the one he'd shove yelled out to Blonde was more than ready to teach him a lesson for trying to surprise a ninja. Sidestepping the first attack, which turned out to be an attempt to smash a rock over his head, Naruto threw his elbow back and slammed it into the kid's nose. The force of the blow knocked the attacker unconscious, and with his downfall, the other three quickly understood that the blonde was someone to fear. They swiftly picked up their fallen leader and made a mad dash for the town nearby. After watching the group scramble away, and making sure they weren't just coming back with more bullies, Naruto turned his attention to the bandaged girl, who was still laying with her face in the sand. They're gone, you can get up now. The Uzumaki said softly as he took a knee beside her. When it looked like she hadn't heard him Naruto reached out a hand and placed it on the downed girl's shoulder. The blonde genin shook her lightly, but when the bandaged victim didn't show any response Naruto started to worry. H hey, come on, get up now. Naruto hurriedly shook the same shoulder, a tone of worry lacing his voice now, a voice that hitched in his throat when he finally rolled the girl over and found there was blood oozing from her head. Turning sharply, the blue-eyed blonde yelled to Anko that he needed her. This girl's bleeding. We have to do something. XXX. Black, pupil-less eyes snapped open while their owner gasped for breath, reeling from the nightmare she just had. Izaribi let her body jolt from the futon she slept against so as to put herself in a more upright position. 
However, before the frightened girl could pull herself up completely she was racked with pain, as her forehead smacked against something hard. Dropping like a sack of potatoes back to the bedding, Izaribi howled in pain, only to choke on her voice when her ears were assaulted with someone else screaming. And a woman's laughter. Fighting the throbbing knot on the front of her skull, Izaribi managed to flutter one of her eyes open and get a look around. What she saw shocked her, it was the blonde from her dream. Which means I it wasn't really a dream the violet-haired girl thought in surprise. Someone really did chase those bullies away. Then, noticing that the uproarious laughter from before had quieted to a snicker fit, Izaribi squinting eyes canvassed the room, until finally, they landed on an older woman leaning against the wall of the hut she was laying in. It was the realization that she, an eight-year-old child, was alone with two older strangers that caused Izaribi to scream again in fright before attempting to scramble to her feet. And while normally this may work the scared young girl's previous collision had aggravated her wounded head, which had been pelted by one of the stones thrown by a bully, and this caused Izaribi to become dizzy. She would have fallen, but a pair of strong arms had shot out and caught her. Her head swimming now, Izaribi's fluttering lashes allowed her a hazy glimpse of her savior. The blonde teen from before. Only this time from her closer position, the young girl managed to get a look at his striking blue eyes. Her brain still rattled from all the trauma, coupled with her lack of nourishment the past few days, Izaribi could feel herself slipping back into unconsciousness. However, before the encroaching darkness took her once more, one thought managed to push its way to the forefront of her mind. His eyes are just like mine. When she next opened her eyes, Izaribi managed to keep herself from freaking out, although it helped that her nose was first assaulted by the strong aroma of delicious food. The violet-haired girl slowly propped herself up with her elbows, using the time to get used to the now shadow-filled hut, it seems night had fallen while she was out. Izaribi gasped. I, it's already night time. Oh no, Dr. Amachi isn't gonna be happy once he finds out I didn't practice with my camaform. The young girl hung her head as her eyes squeezed shut. It's gonna be another week without food, I just know it. Just as the child was beginning to spiral into a resigned form of acceptance though, a voice called out to her from across the hut. Where Izaribi could see there was a fire going, and a pot of food was being cooked. It explained the smell, but the young girl's attention was drawn more towards the direction of that voice. It sounded like a boy. Seeing a head of unruly, blonde hair in her peripheral vision drew Izaribi's attention, and she was proved correct. There, sitting in the corner, was an older boy who looked to be a few years her senior, and while the large sword he was cleaning scared the wits out of her, Izaribi couldn't help the gasp that escaped her when she looked into his eyes. It was you, she whispered. The blonde looked at her funny, an eyebrow raised in confusion, which made the younger girl blush in embarrassment. Her eyes immediately darted down, breaking the eye contact, only to widen in fear when she realized the bandages on her arm were gone, and the scales they hid were in plain sight. First, Izaribi's breath caught in her throat, and then she started to hyperventilate. The older boy in the corner must have seen her scales. However, he must have been able to see the despair on her face, because just as Izaribi was scrambling to get up and bolt for the exit the blonde suddenly appeared before her in a shocking display of speed. Taking hold of her upper arm the masked teen started to speak, his tone rushed by quiet as if he were trying to calm a wild animal as he tried to calm her down. Animal, were the girl's morose thoughts. Just like me. Now wait a minute. The blonde diverged from his original speech. Stop moping and listen to me, yes I saw your scales, but I'm not afraid. Look, my name is Naruto. Why don't you tell me your name, and we can go from there, we can even have some of the noodles boiling in the pot over there. You look like you could use something to eat. Eat. Hearing the offer of food made Izaribi think about Dr. Amachi and her promise to help him with his work, as well as her inevitable punishment for not returning before her guardian set curfew. Recalling the punishments from the past, and imagining what awaited her the violet-haired girl couldn't help but begin to once again sink into despair. Or at least, she would have had a pair of worried blue, eyes not bent down to stare into her own onyx black pair. Startled, Izaribi squeaked and jerked away. The boy Naruto as he'd introduced himself gazed at her with worry and confusion mixed in his sapphire eyes. Hey, what's wrong now? If you really don't like noodles that much we can go get something else, anything you want. 
I just really wanna make sure you eat something. Naruto watched as the girl shuffled her legs underneath her while simultaneously turning her head and trying to pull her arm back, she wanted to hide her scales. Seeing this proved the young Genin's earlier theory that the scales he and Anko had found weren't from a bloodline trait, and instead, were more than likely connected with their target Amachi. Making sure to keep his tone light so as not to scare her, the young Izumaki began to speak again. Wait a second, what's wrong? If you're worried about your scales you shouldn't be, I saw them a while ago when my sensei and I were taking care of that nasty cut on your forehead. Carefully, with a gentleness many would think the blonde incapable of Naruto cupped the younger girl's chin and turned her so their eyes met. I've been watching over you all day do you think if I'd been afraid or disgusted I'd be able to even talk to you let alone get this close? Izaribi's shoulders shuddered and her bottom lip trembled as she felt tears start to well in the corners of her eyes. The eight-year-old diverted her eyes, choosing instead to stare at the far wall, she whispered yes. Blue eyes widened in horror before narrowing in outrage over the history the girl's response reflected. Someone had offered this child kindness as a ruse, and after taking advantage of her trust obviously did something terrible. For Naruto this was the last straw. The young Izumaki had realized almost immediately after removing her bandages that this girl was involved with his target, and had honestly felt a bit of anger towards her for siding with the man, but now, seeing the despair in her eyes, Naruto realized that nothing was as he thought. There was much more to this girl than meets the eyes. Just like him. In an effort to calm the now sobbing girl Naruto reached out his other hand, the one not gripping her upper arm, and let his fingers run through her violet locks. When she flinched his face twitched in an effort to scowl, but the blonde forced the muscles to form instead into what he hoped was a kind grin. Then, in a voice he didn't know he was capable of, Naruto whispered out for the girl to look at him. Izaribi hesitated when the blonde Naruto whispered to her, but she had steadily felt her tense body beginning to relax under his lulling fingers as they swam through her hair. Eventually, she was unable to help herself and the resident orphan of Sea Country let her onyx eyes swivel to meet the ocean blue pair that waited for them. W who are you? While he may have come as a long way from the bumbling buffoon of days past, Naruto still had to catch himself from restating his name. That wasn't what she'd meant, he realized. The girl was asking why he was willing to be so kind to her to help her when everyone else in the village despised and degraded her. I'm a ninja, a shinobi from the village of Konoha, and while I've come to your village on a mission with my sensei that doesn't mean I'll ignore someone in need. It may sound strange to you, but I want you to know that while I'm here, I'll do everything I can to make sure what happened this morning never happens again now, who are you? Hearing that Naruto was a shinobi made Izaribi's eyes widen in surprise as well as amazement. She'd never met a real ninja before, Shuramachi had those two goons that liked to think they were ninja, but Izaribi could tell this guy was the real deal. I mean, who other than a ninja could carry around a sword like his? Seeing the girl's eyes stray to Kubai Kiriboko Naruto came up with an idea. Grinning wide enough that it could be seen from beneath his bandages, the blonde offered a trade, her name for the story of how he'd gotten his sword. And trust me, it's a good one. Izaribi took the bait almost instantly, she loved stories. Although she'd been young when they died, the now eight-year-old girl could still easily recall the many bedtime stories her mother and father would either read to her or make up together. It was these very stories that filled her dreams at night of places far away from her boring and now cruel little fishing village. It was these stories that made her believe Mr. Amachi would really fix her, and, it was the thought of these stories that lead her to answer Naruto's question. And my name is Izaribi, Izaribi Raito. XXX. Anko felt ready to snap. After Naruto had insisted on watching over that strange girl the special Jounin noticed almost immediately that something was going on, especially when they removed her bandages, and found her body littered with scales. There had been multiple patches, scattered from her face all the way to the tops of both feet. And while part of her wanted to pass it off as some weird keke Jenkai, the experienced Kunoichi knew that was wishful thinking, as there had never been such a trait been recorded before. No. This girl definitely had something to do with Amachi, which Anko became more certain of when she'd attempted asking around about her. Whenever the scaly child was brought up, no matter who she spoke with, they shut down or suddenly remembered an errand they had to attend to. 
It got to the point where no one in the village would speak to her, it was infuriating. Although none of these morons were much help on the mission front either the grumbling woman thought as she marched back to the small hut she'd acquired for shelter. And it was true these people knew next to nothing about the man she sought, her time in the tea, and I department coming in handy to make sure no information was being withheld. No, the only thing anyone had to tell her was about the disappearances a couple of years ago that ranged from small children to a few grown men and women. The people would go out like normal to fish, but never came back, and when villagers went to search for them, there was never any trace, like they just vanished. But that doesn't tell me anything other than what I already knew. Anko growled mentally before kicking up a bit of sand in a huff. Anko's pupil-less brown eyes could see her rented shelter a short distance away. This helped quell the burning anger inside as thoughts of food and a night's rest made their way into her mind, the sun had already set, and she was more than ready to let her tired legs rest. A shinobi she may be, but being on her feet all day still wasn't something the woman enjoyed doing. Especially when it all turns out to be for nothing. She crouched again. However, before the battle-hardened Kunoichi could take another step her instincts kicked in, and she leapt to the side so as to avoid being skewered from below. The special Jounin narrowed her eyes as she watched a body rocket up from beneath the sand, spear in hand, before it landed and settled into a fighting stance in front of her. Anko flicked her wrists, and felt the cool steel of her kunai as they fell into her hands. Only to drop them in shock when two arms came from behind and locked her in an arm bar. Good work Shui, the spear wielder congratulated as he walked up to the captured Anko. With the moon shone bright in the sky even without being full, Anko was able to make out the look of one of her captors. He was tall, at least Kakashi's height, with the build of a man who had spent many hours doing hard labor. He had a head of feathery brunette hair, and a face that could almost be called handsome if not for the cruel and disgusting smile that twisted the visage. His upper body was bare, but his lower half was hidden beneath common black pants and shinobi sandals with no headband, it was easy to conclude this guy, and more than likely his partner too, were just washouts from their original ninja village who later became mercenaries. Which makes me wonder how they got the drop on me, Anko growled mentally to herself. As if answering her unspoken question, the one holding her captive opened his mouth to reply to his partner. It wasn't nothing, he spoke in a rough and uneducated manner. That trick gets him every time Ty. Maybe on those weak housewives we snatch from the village, but this one here's a kunoichi a female ninja so I'd say we got lucky, the one known as Tai told Shui in a cocky but cautious tone. But that melted away when the man was within inches of his prey by then his look had morphed into a leering grin. But maybe this is just our reward for doing such a good job working for the good doctor, Ra. The mercenary snatched his head back, inspecting the new, bloody bite mark before clocking Anko with his uninjured fist. You bitch. Despite the throbbing in her left cheek Anko gave a smug grin to the man in front of her, he had attempted to caress her face, but the woman wasn't having it. Careful boys I bite. In a flash, the special Jounin threw her head back and smashed Shui's nose. The man behind her howled in pain, his hands immediately letting go of Anko to clutch at his bloody nose. Then with her body free, Anko snapped her left leg back and planted her foot in the man's stomach. She followed this up by ducking low to avoid a kunai to the throat from the mercenary known as Tai. Years of training kicked in next as Anko gripped his outstretched forearm and slammed her right palm into her enemy's elbow. Sounds of bone breaking were intermingled with cries of pain. Thinking quick, Anko struck like a serpent and swiftly tore open Tai's throat with the kunai she'd kicked up from the sand. Not even blinking as the man's blood squirted from the new opening, Anko turned her attention to her second would-be rapist. The man known as Shui was just now managing to blink through the pain of having his nose broken, and through teary eyes saw his partner crumple to his knees. You fucking slut, you killed him. Seeing nothing but red, Shui barely managed to take his first step in Anko's direction before she vanished from sight, peered behind him, and knocked the fool unconscious. This one should be easy to break. The T and I expert thought peering down at Shui. With her years in the field Anko learned quickly that, normally, every pair had a brain and a brawn type, the brain taking longer to interrogate. However, if one were to separate the two, the dumb one would break quickly without the support of his companion. So, taking a length of ninja wire from her coat pocket, 
Anko went to work stringing up her prisoner before hoisting him over her shoulder. It was as she was finishing the trek to her rented shelter that the woman wondered if these two were connected to the girl Naruto had insisted on watching over. One thing's for sure though, they definitely have a connection to Amachi if what they said earlier is true. XXX. Upon returning to their shared dwelling Anko was surprised to find Naruto regaling the amused looking girl with a story about one of the many pranks he pulled during his time at the academy. Or at least, he had been, but once he noticed her entrance the blonde stopped. Then, seeing the man she had slung over her shoulder Naruto rocketed to his feet in attention. His abrupt silence, followed by the sudden movement, caused the plum-haired girl to turn her own attention towards the door only to gasp in fright when her own eyes landed on the bound mercenary. Seeing her reaction was all the answer Anko needed. I take it then that you know who he is. Hearing this Naruto turned his eyes from his sensei, over to Aizaribi before asking if it was true. Is this the guy who gave you those scales Aizaribi? Flinching at the mention of her condition Aizaribi couldn't keep from folding in on herself, arms hugging around her small frame as her dark eyes turned to look at the floor. Worrying her bottom lip for a moment, the eight-year-old chanced to look at the blonde beside her. Seeing the same outreaching look from before, the one that urged her to trust him, she couldn't help but believe that just maybe he could help her. And no that's not Dr. Amachi, his name is Shui, one of the doctor's guards. For a second she battled with herself about continuing, but the hope of freeing herself from the feeling of loneliness Aizaribi had felt under Amachi convinced the girl to keep going. I if he's here then Dr. Amachi must have gotten impatient with my lateness. Which means he's furious. Naruto saw the way Aizaribi's eyes squeezed shut as she hissed out that last word, it worried him. What he didn't see though was that it worried Anko as well, especially when her trained eye didn't see any form of past abuse on the young girl. Pupil-less brown eyes narrowed into slits as their owner forced down the animalistic growl that threatened to rumble in Anko's throat. Leveling her tone so as not to scare Aizaribi and hopping she was wrong the kunoichi asked, and what happens when Dr. Amachi gets furious? The answer was plain for someone like Anko to see. The way Aizaribi's whole body trembled as her knees turned in on each other closing her thighs, as bone white knuckles pushed down the hem of her t-shirt. Even Naruto, with no real experience in the subtleties of body language, knew not to probe the question any further. It was clear what sort of punishment the man known as Dr. Amachi dealt out. Seeing how shaken Aizaribi looked now Naruto moved into her space and, reaching out, threw the younger girl into a hug. With his shaggy blonde hair covering his eyes one couldn't see their expression, but all someone had to do was look at the teen's own shaking form to know Naruto as Amaki was close to flying into a rampage. For Aizaribi, the moment she was enveloped in the warmth and safety of the hug, she broke down in tears. Sobs racked through her body, sending her shoulders into a frenzy as memories of those horrid nights played back in her mind. Burying herself as deep as possible in Naruto's arms, Aizaribi wailed in despair. He please, don't make me go back. Oni-san please, I'll be good, just just please don't and make me go back. Hearing the younger girl's plea only made Naruto hold her closer. For one so young to feel such fear, to know this kind of pain, should be impossible. Memories of the blonde's own childhood played through his mind like a slideshow and yet, Naruto knew nothing he felt was anything like Aizaribi's pain. He may have been alone, but the girl in his arms had been trapped. Caged like a rat, knowing only twisted, perverted versions of affection. It was enough that Naruto felt the same wall shatter from when he thought Haku killed Sasuke. The Kyuubi's chakra slowly leaked through his body as Naruto vowed to slit Amachi's throat himself. Don't worry Aiza-chan you aren't ever going back there again. Tonight, Enko-sensei and I are going to make sure that bastard Amachi won't ever be able to hurt you again. The protective assuring tone Aizaribi heard was enough to help stop the trembling of her body, and allowed the eight-year-old girl to gather enough of herself so as to look up into her savior's eyes. What she saw normally something that would be found in nightmares, only further cemented Aizaribi's belief her Oni-san had been sent specifically to save her. Naruto's eyes were cast in the shaggy shadow of his blonde hair, making their now crimson color glow eerily, while his slit pupils stared down at the girl in his arms with a glint of something primal in their vulpine depths. With the lower half of his face bandaged none could see his new set of fangs or thickened whiskers, 
But by the way his jaw was fixed they could tell the young as a Maki was gritting his teeth in an attempt to keep his emotions in check. Knowing her young charge needed to be reined in, lest he lose himself, Anko stepped further into the hut and told Naruto that they still needed to interrogate their captive. Because in spite of your new strength and even having me at your side, we don't know what to expect from this Dr. Amachi. I'd rather not have us run in there half-cocked only to fall into some trap that can easily be avoided with a few minutes of thinking ahead, if we aren't smart about this, you won't be able to keep your promise to young Izaribi here. At the thought of the young girl in his arms falling back into the hands of her tormentor was enough to get Naruto under control. He'd never broken a promise before, and now definitely wasn't the time to start. Peering down his nose at Izaribi one more time Naruto combed his clawed fingers through her violet tresses a few times before stepping back from her and, hand still atop Izaribi's head, asked his sensei what she needed from him. Since I don't really think you're ready to perform your first torture session I just need you to take your new friend outside. I know it's a bit odd considering what just happened to me, but unless Izaribi thinks she can stomach watching me work it's the only other option, Anko explained, having further explained her thoughts when Naruto looked at her like the special Jounin was crazy. Blowing an unsure breath through his nose Naruto took Izaribi's hand with the intent to follow orders, only to look at the aforementioned girl when she refused to start walking. Iza-chan, what's wrong? Izaribi's onyx black eyes looked from the man she knew was Shui, who the woman known as Anko had dropped into the far corner, then looked to the blonde holding her hand. Her gaze was hesitant for a moment before, after taking one last look to Shui, the child whispered that she wanted to stay, she wanted to watch. On his end Naruto was shocked. She wanted to watch someone be tortured. Eyeing her wearily the blonde asked if she was sure, saying he wouldn't think any less of her either way and sighing softly in agreement when Izaribi reaffirmed her decision to stay. Something that while he didn't understand would honor if Anko said it was okay. And she did. Because while Naruto didn't understand Izaribi's thoughts, the older shinobi did. She'd seen cases like this a few times before, she herself being one of them. It tended to happen to those who had suffered at the hands of of someone else, made worse when it's a person they believed could be trusted. Thoughts would begin to form during the torment, usually after accepting the reality of their situation about the positions being reversed, and the tormentor becoming the victim. This filth must have taken part in that bastard Amachi's punishments, Anko summarized before letting Naruto know he and Izaribi were allowed to stay, as well as leave should watching become too hard. Neither the blonde, nor the young girl who wound up in his lap left the hut that night, and both watched, unblinking as Anko went to work. But the screams of pain, which helped lull Izaribi to sleep mixed with Naruto's heartbeat, would ring in the Uzumaki's ears and bring back memories of the final battle at the Great Naruto Bridge. Only this time, it wasn't Zabuza doing the killing, but Naruto himself. Anko's hypothesis proved true, and in just about an hour and a half of starting in on her prey, the ninja had everything they needed to plan their final move. Then Naruto watched as Anko killed their captive. There's no redeeming scum like him so there was no reason to let him live, she'd explained upon seeing his questioning look. Something you need to understand Naruto is that there really is such a thing as evil in this life, and that it won't always be easy to spot like Orochimaru. Because, honestly, can you tell me you'd have pegged this man for a monster had you both just been walking down the street? Naruto could honestly shake his head no. Exactly, was Anko's firm reply. Remember that lesson Naruto, because it's important, don't ever just blindly trust anyone, because you never know who's really a wolf waiting to take a bite out of you. Leaving her temporary student with that last bit of advice the former apprentice to Orochimaru bid goodnight to her blonde charge before sealing the dead Shue inside a scroll and laying down in her sleeping bag. Naruto was only up a few minutes longer, letting his eyes linger on the spot their dead captive had been bound in, before letting his eyes drift shut. That night his dreams were filled with thoughts of if he would have been able to torture Shui. When next he awoke, Naruto was surprised only a moment at the weight against his chest before recalling the previous day's events. Upon the recollection however his blue eye steeled into a cold cobalt as his memory pulled forth the plan he and Anko had come up with. Today was the day. Seeing the absence of a sleeping bag and deducing that Anko must be standing outside on the shore Naruto carefully shifted Izaribi in his arms cradling her against his chest, before making his exit from the fishing cabin. Sure enough upon his exit, 
The blonde Izumaki's eyes quickly found his pseudo-sensei staring out at a speck of an island among the vast ocean. Being sure not to wake the still-sleeping girl in his arms Naruto made his way over and asked, That's our target, isn't it? That island over there. Anko's response was a silent nod of her head. Naruto could see out of the corner of his eye that there was something on the older Kunoichi's mind, the faraway look in her normally light eyes let the blonde know the woman was reliving a memory. That's when the blonde remembered the mission briefing the Hokage had given them in his office, Dr. Amachi worked for Orochimaru. Turning so he could properly see his partner Naruto asked if the woman was okay. You can be the one to take his life if it helps Anko Sensei. Hearing her students offer broke the woman from her fuzzy recollection of the island that lay before her, she just begun to recall being woken up on a cold medical table by an ambu, and caused the violet-haired Kunoichi to blink rapidly so as to bring herself back to the present. Shaking her head in the negative, Anko told Naruto that wasn't necessary. If you see a chance to take the bastard out, I want you to jump on it. We can't afford to let this creep keep up his twisted science projects. A whimper drew both ninjas' attention to the now-awake child Naruto was arms full of. It seems the crashing of the waves had woken the little girl, and she'd caught the last of their talk. Thinking of herself as one of those twisted science projects, Aizaribi felt her heart clench. Only her Oni-san's comforting embrace, matched by his hushed words helped calm the distraught girl's worries. That is, at least, until Aizaribi heard Anko's next words. Sorry to tell you both this. But Izaribi's gonna need to play a part in our getting inside. XXX. Dark, watery eyes looked up fearfully at the equally black camera lens that allowed Dr. Amachi to see who was at the entrance to his lab. Izaribi knew this wasn't the only one either, the man had cameras all over the island as well as inside. The girl shuddered thinking of some of the places she'd found those cameras. The tremors of disgust must have been mistaken for ones of fear because once she finished Izaribi heard the telltale buzzing that preceded the unlocking of the large iron doors before her. After this the eight-year-old was blasted with a gust of cold air as the entrance slid open both doors sinking into the rocks around them. Seeing her path clear, Izaribi entered and began the long trek down the main corridor. Straw sandals slapped against the tiled floor and their owner thanked the heavens that she wasn't forced to make the journey in bare feet, that would have been torture, thinking about how ice-like the floor must feel. It took about 15 minutes, the girl having shuffled along slowly for Izaribi to reach the break-off point. Three doors now stood before her. One she knew was the main security room where all the camera feeds were sent, while the other two were a mystery. The lab was accessed through the floor she now stood on. Except, Izaribi wasn't taken to the lab. Where are Shui and Tai came Amachi's voice through the intercom system, I sent them to collect you hours ago, and yet you have arrived alone. Explain. Hearing the man's voice, and the veiled rage underneath made Izaribi nauseous. To her it felt like her stomach had just hit the floor, while her heart had jumped into her throat but thinking about what consequences awaited not answering the question she managed to croak out a response. I, I don't need a babysitter doctor, as you can see, I've returned all on my own. I just w wanted some time to feel. Normal. A single heavy breath was let out over the intercom before the gears in the floor sprang to life, and Izaribi was slowly lowered into the floor. Do normal girls steal Izaribi? came the now mocking voice over the intercom. Dr. Amachi had been referring to the girl's new state of dress. Gone was the stitch-laden, brown robe the girl wore like a dress, held together by a lighter tan sash. In its place the young child now wore a sky-blue kimono and a white obi to hold it closed. While simple in its design, a girl like Izaribi would have been unable to pay for it. Knowing this, and shoving away Amachi's attempts to break her spirit, Izaribi lowered her gaze and shook her head. And no, but I took it in hopes that I it would. Please you. Just getting the words past her lips made the girl want to puke. But they worked. The next thing to pass through the speakers was an appraising, but approving hum. From there the rest of Izaribi's ride was filled with silence, which the girl was thankful for. Her stomach was in knots, and she wasn't sure how much longer she could go on talking without throwing up. Now though, the violet-haired child could focus on breathing. When the drop finally reached the laboratory, Izaribi was greeted with the eerie smile of Dr. Amachi. 
He was a thin man with a head of straw blonde hair. He wore a lab coat over a set of average clothes and was fitted into a pair of shinobi sandals. His beady black eyes were trained solely on Izaribi. Well now, seeing it in person I must say your new look is quite lovely Izaribi, why don't come closer so I can get get a better look at you. The man's gaze frightened the young swimmer, it was a mix of animalistic hunger and anger. A combination she unfortunately knew well. She also knew what would happen if she denied him. So, swallowing the bile that rose in her throat, Izaribi shuffled over to the man in front of her. Once she was within arm's reach Amachi knelt down to be at eye level with her, only to shoot a hand out and wrap it around her throat. As the child struggled to breath Amachi reached out his other hand and tightly gripped her wrist. Bringing her hand up the man asked, did you really think I wouldn't notice this? With her arm raised the sleeve of her kimono dropped to reveal Izaribi had a kunai in her hand. Slapping the girl to the floor, the pain knocking the weapon loose, the enraged scientist then went on to kick Izaribi in the ribs. Stupid girl. After everything I've done for you, this is the thanks I get. You filthy bitch, it seems you need to be reminded of your place, a chart. While Amachi was busy berating his whimpering charge he failed to notice the shimmer of movement as blue eyes circled around him. So wrapped up in his rant was he that the fool hadn't noticed his assassin get in position behind him. The shock of having his throat slit didn't fully register until Amachi crumpled to the floor and watched as two pairs of shinobi sandals shimmered into existence in front of him. Managing to lift his dimming sight Amachi's last image of the living world was of a blonde teen standing next to a woman he recognized as Anko Mitarashi. Once Naruto was sure the life had left his target the blonde felt his rage subside. It had taken every ounce of his self-control not to rush the man the moment he laid eyes on him but Izaribi's plea for a chance to do the deed herself halted him. At least until she was discovered. Then it became personal and Naruto used his newly acquired stealth technique to deliver the killing blow. It wasn't fancy, and there was no great battle to precede the man's demise. It was as a ninja assassination should be, unexpected and silent. While Anko moved over to the man's computer to begin extracting files Naruto went and scooped Izaribi into his arms to help assure her that everything was finished. He can't hurt you anymore Iza-chan, it's over. It took an expert like Anko only minutes to move every file on Amachi's computer onto a mini drive, but while she told Naruto he and Izaribi were free to head back, she herself had business in the lab. Knowing what type the woman meant. The blonde genin allowed Anko her privacy before exiting the lab and walking into the fresh air outside, mentally noting for Izaribi at least, it was like finally walking into the light after fighting her way through a dark tunnel. Chapter 8 Minus Clashing Steel Naruto vs. 1010 XXX The clear blue sky hanging over the village of Konoha was dotted with colorful smoke as fireworks were set off in celebration. After four long work-filled weeks the day everyone was waiting for had arrived. It was time for the third, and final part of the Chunin exams. At the gates copious foreigners were checked in by the guards Izumo and Kotetsu. Hundreds of thousands of people ranging from a peddler looking to sell their goods to daimyo of other countries looking to scout for talent, had turned up eager to take part in the action. But even with all the excitement going on there were those who had no time to partake in the festivities, those few were the competitors in the day's main event. Each genin could be found at home preparing for their upcoming match, and hoping that the training they had done over the past month would be enough to earn the title of Chunin. Today's the day 1010 thought confidently as she strapped a pair of pauldron to her shoulders. Finishing with her preparations the young Kun Oichi looked herself over. Aside from shoulder guards, the bun-haired girl had fitted a pair of shin guards to her legs as well as a chainmail shirt to cover her torso. Around her waist for added protection were two extra guards for her thighs. While not normally one for armor 1010 knew that, going up against Naruto, she couldn't afford to take any chances. So making sure to keep her selections light, but firm the weapon mistress considered herself ready. One last check to make sure all her scrolls were stored properly, and 1010 was headed out the door with her father. In the clan sector of the village within the walls of the Hugo compound, both Hinata and her cousin, Neji were preparing for their match as well. Against each other. 
The Hugo heiress, like her fellow Kunoichi, stood in front of a full-length mirror. But rather than readying herself physically the younger girl's actions aimed more towards the mental aspect of competition. I can do this, the heiress thought with conviction. Hinata had proven she could take whatever force an opponent could dish out, and now with her increased training from her father, felt more than sure she could send it back twice as hard. I it doesn't matter that it's Neji was Hinata's attempt at convincing her own mind, but berated herself for the mental hiccup. Shaking her head fiercely so that her, now shoulder-length hair whipped about Hinata hardened her gaze at the reflection she saw and exited her room chin held high. Unlike his cousin though Neji Hyuga would not be found giving himself a mental pep talk. No, instead the Hyuga genius was more interested in letting his thoughts wander to how much he was going to make his cousin suffer. He had seen the spoiled daughter of his uncle Hayashi as she trained with the man her skills in the family Teijutsu were nowhere close to his own. Yes, she'd managed the full 64 palms, but Neji knew that against his superior speed it would mean nothing. Because in the end it won't matter how much she trains, her predestined limits cannot surpass my own fated genius. This match was over before it even started, destiny has already seen to that. It was these final thoughts that Neji left the Hugo compound with. A very similar train of thought made its way through the mind of one Sasuke Uchiha as he too finished getting ready for the finals. However, unlike the rest, the youngest son of Mikoto Uchiha would not be found at home. The young Avenger stood amidst several shattered boulders deep within a canyon outside of Konoha. Beside him stood Kakashi, the Jounin watching as his student strapped the final belt to his new outfit. The copy ninja felt the black spandex would help keep Sasuke more aerodynamic for his fight. No loose sleeves to billow in the wind as he ran. The belts however were special, they were currently circulating the boy's chakra in his arm, making sure it flowed much easier for his new attack. As he flexed his bandage-covered hand Sasuke couldn't help feeling the fires of rage build up inside as he was forced to look on with only half his vision. While not totally destroying the optical organ Kiba's mud had cost him much of the sight in his right eye, the scarred tissue surrounding the socket forming three diagonal reminders of the incident. If he ever wanted to have perfect vision again, Sasuke would require an implant. And while that vexed him the thing that truly sent the last Uka's temper sky high was the fact that there would be no punishment for Kiba. It burned Sasuke to the core, and he had demanded retribution from the Hokage as well as the council, but was stopped short when they all informed him that in granting his request he too would be punished. And why is that? Kiba's mongrel just cost me one of my Sharingan a clan secret by law, he deserves to be minus Sasuke hadn't been able to finish because Tsum and Uzuka being forcibly restrained interrupted him. Mongrel? Shikaku let go of me right now, I need to teach this insolent pup what happens when you insult a pack member of the Inuzuka clan. The normally feral looking but friendly Jounin had dropped all pretenses of civility and looked ready to rip Sasuke's head off. When her rage-filled eyes noticed the dismissive look the boy was giving her she practically ordered the Hokage to explain where the Uchiha could stick his demands. Finally thinking he was going to speak to someone with sense Sasuke did in fact turn his attention on the elderly shinobi who sat before him. Only to see that what he was told next. I'm sorry to say it Sasuke but in regards to your demands there really is nothing we can do without punishing you as well. When it looked like the boy was going to argue though Hiruzen cut across him in the exams it is fully understood by all who participate that things such as death or mutilation are a possibility. These exams are set up to demonstrate real life scenarios, information gathering, vicious long term assignments, and even deadly combat. And just because mauling your opponent isn't encouraged doesn't mean it never happens. But that still doesn't answer why Kiba is getting away with breaking the law. Actually, Sasuke Uchiha, it does. This came from Inoichi Yamanaka who was seated beside Shikaku Nara and a now less irate soon. What you seem to be forgetting the Yamanaka patriarch continued to explain is that each and every genin who chooses to take part in the advancement exam are required to fill out an application. This not only allows the for keeping track of all the new faces flooding the host's village, but there's also a written agreement, like the one given for the forest of death asking if the genin in question is willing to accept the risks involved with testing. In this case, the loss of your sight, or a Kamaru's death. At this point the Hokage took over again, 
which means Sasuke that by filling out that applicant form you signed off that you understood the risks involved with taking the exams, and were choosing to attempt them anyway. Legally, there truly is nothing to be done other than hand you the compensation fee given out to families that lose a member in the exams. As he clenched his bandaged fist in anger Sasuke recalled the end of his meeting with the Konoha Shinobi Council, and how they went on to explain that if not for the paperwork, any village could seek retribution or even declare war, over what they might perceive as a targeted attack on any of their shinobi. There truly was nothing Sasuke could do. For the first time since his family's massacre Sasuke found himself unable to extort his inflated title to get what he wanted. And although it wasn't something he made a terrible habit of, the last Achiha found he didn't like the idea of being told no. Fortunately though for the boy's frustrated feelings, his sensei calling him to run through one last spar before heading to the finals gave him something to vent at. XXX. From atop the Hokage's monument, sharp blue eyes stared out over the village. A few times they strayed towards the large stadium where the finals would soon be taking place where Naruto knew he would soon hopefully become a chunin. Thinking back over the month he trained under Anko the blonde couldn't help smiling under his bandages. After their time in sea country the duo had returned with their new friend, Izaribi, and reported their mission a success. It was only after Anko handed their Hokage a scroll containing everything she plundered from Amachi's lab, that the woman's face broke from its stern facade and she ordered her student to meet her outside the forest of death the following morning. Chuckling quietly to himself Naruto recalled how he was expecting her to use the area for their continued training period, only to be surprised when she instead handed him another mission scroll. This one a C rank, was a cleansing of the forest surrounding bear country, the populace had been overrun by bandits. When he asked about his training, Anko informed him that there was no better way to train him in being a chunin than giving him ample, real-world experience. She informed him that books and practice sessions only got one so far, and that instinct and experience were key to becoming a successful squad leader. And so it was after enrolling his new charge, Izaribi into the Ninja Academy that student and teacher left to take on their next mission. One that, like the last, would turn out to be more than meets the eye. Because that's where I met you, the young Izumaki thought fondly as his sharp stare softened. Letting his eyes drop to his lap, Naruto gazed fondly at the small wolf pup cuddling his stomach. However, if one were to look they would quickly see that this small creature was very different from the average wild dog. For starters, while its fur was a shimmering onyx color the perfection was streaked with numerous lines of red. And even the contrasted fur itself was different, instead of simple splashes of color. They formed runic-like symbols in the pup's coat. But that wasn't the only thing separating Naruto's furry friend from an everyday wolf, its tail, instead of fur was made up of a pure blue flame. This wolf pup was a member of the Hufu Kami, the Flaming Wolf Clan. Her name was Maya, and she was one of the lowest level summons in Naruto's contract. It had been by accident that Naruto found out about the Hakfu Kami, as he'd never even heard of them. But during his mission with Anko the young genin had found little Maya snagged in a hideous hunting trap. The jaws snapped shut around the whimpering pup's hind leg. What made matters worse were the men that surrounded her. Naruto still remembered the rage he felt, seeing some of the very same bandits he'd been sent to exterminate about to end the life of such an innocent creature. It was without hesitation that the blonde sprung into action, swiftly dispatching the circle of filth before then turning his attention to the injured pup. He'd barely taken a step before the cavalry arrived though. Through the trees a handful of wolves burst forth, bypassing Naruto and surrounding their downed pack member. And while normally this would set anybody on edge, Naruto had nearly let his eyes pop from his skull when he took a closer look at his new company. Each of them was a different color some the common gray or brown, but others stood out with shockingly orange or even green fur. From there it had quickly gotten interesting as Naruto rushed to explain the scene, pointing out the other men laying on the ground to help corroborate his story. However it wasn't until the pup had been freed and tended to that the other wolves fully believed him. And that's when the leaf shinobi was given another shock, it had been a test. The wolves explained that they had sensed Naruto's arrival, telling the blonde that the older members of their pack had innate sensory abilities, and that they wished to see if his character was as upstanding as his strength. 
They themselves were then in for a surprise when Naruto explained that the power they had felt actually belonged to the Kyuubi, and that he himself was still only a genin. But that didn't change their mind one bit, Naruto thought as he let his hand run through Maya's sleek, furry coat. I was taken to their elder and offered the chance to sign their contract. Naruto then recalled, after returning to Anko how the woman had become ecstatic over her little hatchling having procured his own summon, as well as her express interest in how they did in the field. In short order, the bandit camp was cleaned away an entire day ahead of schedule. After that Naruto and Anko managed to complete one more mission before, with only a handful of days left, they would spend the rest of their time doing exactly what the blonde had expected from the beginning. With the help of his new summons, Anko ran her charge through the gauntlet that was the forest of death. And now, it's time to put all that work to the test. Which can't happen if you're disqualified for being late Oni-san, came a familiar voice from behind the now standing blonde. Naruto turned and, with Maya curling against his shoulder, accepted the hug his Aiza chan moved to give him. In the month she'd been in the academy, the girl had brightened considerably from the forlorn youth her blonde savior had found her ass. And while the genin had been deemed too young to care for Aizaribi on his own, Anko had agreed to take the girl in and be her guardian. The two women's relationship was uneasy at the best of times, but Aizaribi was just glad to be able to visit her big brother whenever she wanted. Laughing quietly at the younger girl's jibe Naruto assured Aizaribi that he was leaving now and would be on time. Good, because you need to hurry up and make Jounin so I don't have to worry about who my sensei will be after I graduate. Naruto just reminded her she still had a few more years to go before having to worry about that, and then asked her to wish him luck before disappearing in a whirlwind of leaves. XXX. The genin competing in the finals all stood in a single file line. The six pairs of eyes that looked back at Genma Shirinui almost all held a look of fierce determination, only two held something different, arrogance and boredom. Wait six. Genma looked again, and indeed found that two of the finalists were missing. Where are Naruto Izumaki and Sasuke Uchiha? While my teammate is probably lost somewhere on the road of life, I'm right here. The new, but familiar voice caused each person on the stadium grounds to crane their necks, Naruto had been standing behind Genma the entire time. However, the sight that filled their eyes was something none of them expected. What a drag, we can always count on Naruto to make a spectacle of himself were Shikamaru's thoughts as he took in the blonde's new attire. Gone was the hooded vest. In its place was a black trench coat, clipped at the waist, whose torso and sleeves were fitted perfectly to the blonde's frame, while everything below the waist billowed outwards. Like Naruto's old vest, this too had a hood, its shadows covered all but the young man's still bandaged jaw. Onlookers could also see, with the zipper pulled partway down, that the blonde was bare-chested underneath. Naruto's lower body was clothed in something similar to his coat, form-fitting black pants that disappeared into knee-high, plated boots. His hands were hidden underneath pure black gloves, while the ever-imposing Kubai Kiraboko rested in its carrier against his back. As he walked over to join his fellow Leaf Shinobi some of them couldn't help noticing that despite his lack of height, the blondes looked cut an impressively imposing figure. Seeing that he now at least had both competitors for the opening match Genma decided that was more than good enough to begin. Alright then, seeing as at least we can start things off properly let's get this thing started. If you take a second to look around you'll see that the stands are filled with not only villagers from Konoha, but numerous dignitaries and travelers from across the country. They are all here for one purpose to watch you. They've all traveled thousands of miles to see what talented shinobi you all are, so how about we give them a good show? Eyeing Naruto and Ten Ten he explained, like last time that the two of them would be staying put while the other genin were to ascend into the stands. It was as he was moving into position that Naruto remembered something. Hey wait where's that guy Genma, the one who proctored the preliminary rounds. Genma told the hooded blonde about how a complication concerning the man's coughing fits kept him from being able to referee the finals. And while Naruto felt bad for the man he could only accept the news before turning his attention back to 1010. Now, if there are no more questions and you two are ready, then let the first match of the Chunin exam finals begin. XXX. Neither 1010 nor Naruto took their eyes off each other as their proctor leapt back out of the way with the match officially on, both knew that to do so could spell defeat. 
clenching, and in opening her fists in calm succession the bun-haired girl smirked at her shorter opponent. I've been training all month for this moment Naruto, I hope you're ready. From underneath his bandages, she saw him match her smirk with one of his own. That's flattering, but I'm sorry to say that I just don't think it'll be enough. Ten Ten smirk morphed into a challenging grin as she swiftly pulled two handful of kunai from the holsters on her thighs and answered, We'll just see about that. Making the first move the brunette kunawichi launched her small volley of kunai at her opponent. However she didn't stop there once her hands were free the girl leapt into the air and pulled a scroll from a pouch on her belt. Unsealing the weapon inside, Ten Ten revealed a sickle and chain. However, unlike most this one had a link far longer than the customary length. Swinging the weighted end swiftly over her head the bun-haired brunette launched it when she noticed her opponent simply deflected her hail of kunai with a single one of his own. Naruto saw the attack coming and after knocking away the last opposing kunai, jumped back out of the heavy iron ball's flight path. Blue eyes widened underneath the cowl of their owner's hood though when the blonde watched as Ten Ten let the ball's impact into the ground jerk her into a dive attack. Steel clashed as Naruto's kunai fended off his female opponent's comma. Twisting her body Ten Ten hauled herself over her fellow genin, but using her free hand also made sure to wrap her weapon's chain around his neck as she landed. It was as she touched the ground though that the armor-clad fighter spun on the balls of her feet so as to bring herself crouched in front of Naruto's chest. Jerking the bit of chain wrapped around her hand Ten Ten pulled Naruto forward and into a fierce palm strike. While normally she would have thought to use her comma, the bun-haired Kunoichi knew that she and Naruto would both do their best to avoid lethal hits, there was no fun if one of them ended up dead after all. Naruto choked as the hit struck home, but just as quickly smiled before he exploded into a cloud of smoke marking him as a shadow clone. Ten Ten just as quickly reeled in her chain before sealing it away and replacing it with a short sword shield combo. I can't say I'm too surprised, but I am curious as to when he did the switch. Or for that matter when the clone was even made. Thoughts on her opponent's battle strategy were put on hold however as chocolate brown eyes watched the arena begin to fill with mist. Up in the stands many spectators ruffled their feathers at their view being cut off. The shinobi among the civilian mass held a different opinion though. He's breaking out that technique already. Asuma questioned as he and his fellow Jounin looked on. Turning his attention to Anko who stood to the left of Kirena he asked her thoughts on the boy's decision. Don't you worry about what my student is doing Asuma, just worry about what'll happen to yours if he has to go up against him. Seeing the smug look on her longtime friend's face, Kirena raised a questioning eyebrow of her own and wondered when exactly did he officially become your student Anko? Isn't he still part of Squad 7? Pupil-less brown eyes gleamed with confidence, a strange sight given the question, until the woman being asked eagerly replied. That's only until the exams are over, once these matches are through, the kid's all mine as far as I'm concerned. You have that much confidence in his ability to impress the judges? Mike Guy chimed in. He himself had seen the great lengths his students had gone in training for this day, but even still would be hard-pressed to consider them Chunin worthy. I do. Was the only reply Enko gave as she returned her eyes to the field below. Back down in the field 10-10 had changed her position. Instead of a crouched, ready stance the girl had shifted so that she now had one knee pressed against the earth and her shield covering her entire left side. With her sword poised for attack and her senses strained Ten Ten couldn't help feeling excited. While not an open clash of steel the bun-haired Kunoichi was still enjoying herself, the thrill of the unknown sent her heart racing. However it was the blood rushing to her ears that almost kept her from hearing the oncoming attack. It was lightning fast, and the girl barely managed to roll out of the way of the Shuriken storm, but after doing so realized her folly. Now Naruto knew her position. The next attack was a heavy one, it smashed against the girl's shield and sent her toppling into the dirt. The follow-up came just as quick, a lightning-fast maneuver that glanced the down Kunochi's unprotected left side. Gr. Ten Ten grunted in pain, thankful that her chainmail shirt had managed to absorb most of the attack. In an act of pure reflex the girl's arm shot out, sword swinging attempting to strike a blow against her attacker. No dice. Ten Ten's blade found nothing but air, 
and the girl quickly paid for it with another glancing blow, this time to her open back. However unlike the last attack, which had felt more like the slash of steel claws, this one was very easily identified as a Spartan kick. The force of the attack had the unbalanced brunette once again finding her face in the dirt. Only this time, instead of landing in a heap, Ten Ten managed to carry herself with the momentum and rolled into another defensive crouch. It was in that position that the girl waited. Ten Ten sucked air into her lungs as she tried to calm her racing heart. Naruto was much more skilled than she'd expected. To create a mist so thick and maintain it so long was a feat no normal genin could ever hope to accomplish. And yet, just as the bun-haired girl allowed her mind to praise her opponent for this amazing skill the mist began to clear. It happened slowly as if to act like the reveal of some big mystery, but eventually Ten Ten's chocolate brown eyes were filled with the full color view of the arena, one that included an image of Naruto standing barely 10 feet from her down position. I want to thank you for letting me test out that strategy 10-10. I thought it up just yesterday, so it's not exactly battlefield ready, but you've shown me that with a little tweaking it could be effective. The blonde's appreciation was lost on all who heard him as they hadn't been able to see a thing, while the girl being thanked assumed it had been something to do with his clones. What neither she or the spectators below Jounin level knew was that the blonde had just tested an attack pattern with his new summons. From her spot on the ground, Ten Ten grinned to her fellow Jenin though, giving little thought to the fact that she had just been knocked around, and instead chose to revel in the fact that she'd been paired with such a fun opponent. Standing to her feet and settling back into her defensive stance the armored weapon mistress called to Naruto, I'm more than happy to help Naruto, but what do you say we take some time to give these people a show? The judges do have to see how well we do in open combat after all. Knowing exactly what she meant the hooded blonde reached back and tightly gripped the handle of his large sword. Pulling it free, Naruto brought it to rest against the ground with both hands. Letting her smile overtake her face Ten Ten tensed the muscles in her left arm before pulling back, and then launching it and her shield forward. With the release of her defense Ten Ten quickly pulled another scroll from her belt, dropping her short sword in the scramble, before summoning forth a vicious looking spear. Naruto dodged the shield before watching as she made good on her word to give the crowd a show by showing off a multitude of flashy spin moves with her new weapon of choice. Content to follow her advice, as it would give him time to loosen up, the young Izumaki allowed his opponent the chance to finish before pushing off of his right foot and rushing into battle. As expected Naruto found himself sliding out of the way as Ten Ten thrust her spear's gold-plated tip at his sternum. Letting his body swing around, the blonde lowered into a crouch before attempting to knock the bun-haired girl's feet out from under her with the flat of his large blade. Ten Ten caught on quick though, and easily managed to avoid being taken down. Following through with her opening thrust the young Kunoichi ran her spearhead into the ground, and then used it to vault into the air before snapping a leg out in a kick that caught the side of Naruto's head. Please when her target didn't burst into smoke this time Ten Ten fished out another handful of shuriken before launching them as she dropped to the ground. Rolling with the hit he'd just taken Naruto ended in a crouch, and hearing the fast approaching projectiles moved Kubai Kiriboko to act as a shield. Peering over the large blade of his sword Naruto was a little surprised to see his opponent rushing towards him. Thinking quick Naruto followed the girl's lead and shoved his weapon into the earth when he felt she was close enough. Only this time, the blonde chose to leap over her completely before dead-legging her, and finishing up by slamming her head against his planted sword. However when Naruto went on to try and follow through with an elbow strike he was halted by Ten Ten's quick grab for the incoming smash attack. Using one of her fancy practice maneuvers, Ten Ten flipped and gripped the tail end of her spear before ramming it into Naruto's gut. With the wind knocked out of him now Ten Ten's next move was to take hold of her weapon with both hands and snap it up, slamming it into the underside of her blonde opponent's jaw. Spittle flew from Naruto's lips as he just managed to miss biting his own tongue. However before he could think to try a counter-attack, the hooded genin found himself being slammed full force with his female foe's weapon. Ten Ten had swung it like a bat, and the resounding strength behind the blow sent the unprepared young blonde skidding back along the arena floor. With Naruto at least a good five yards away Ten Ten quickly jammed her spear into the ground and reached out to take hold of Kubai Kiriboko's handle. 
A shiver of excitement racked the girl's body as she felt the latent power that seemed to ooze from the just the grip alone. Feeling her muscles flex, the girl went and pulled the sword from the earth. Or at least she tried to. Ten Ten found that with just a single arm she barely even able to budge the sword much less free it from its dirty sheath, so the girl condemned herself to using two hands, and with a groan of effort finally pulled her opponent's weapon free. Holy mother of this thing's gotta weigh at least 80 pounds. How on earth does he even swing this thing, let alone throw it? Although she trained under the physically powerful might guy 1010 herself had never been one for muscular strength making adjustments to heavier weapons to better suit her personal style. Because of that the girl found herself unable to even lift the head cleaver from its resting place against the ground. Her distraction cost her. A fully packed knuckle sandwich was served to her cheek and the powerful punch sent 1010 rocketing back. Hands ripping from their hold on the large sword's handle and feet lifting off the ground, every spectator in the arena watched as 1010 was sent flying through the air. A pair of blue eyes in particular kept themselves trained on their owner's opponent while a gloved hand reached out and caught the fumbled blade, stopping the famous sword from clattering to the dirt. Not willing to waste an opportunity Naruto quickly followed after his stunned, bun-haired adversary and swiftly managed to close the gap before passing her. Tensing his body, the blonde hopped into the air and delivered a devastating spin kick. Landing safely Naruto watched a moment as 1010 rolled across the arena grounds before finally stopping on her side. Propped up by her scraped left arm the aforementioned Kunoichi spat out the glob of blood that had pooled in her mouth from the harsh sucker punch she'd received only seconds ago. With stained teeth and a distasteful aftertaste burning her tongue 1010 pushed herself onto all fours before making it to a kneeling position. But after only a few seconds to catch her breath, the lightly battered young girl felt her eyebrows jump towards her hairline in shock as she was covered by a dark shadow. Shooting her eyes up, 1010 barely had time to summon a pair of Kodeki and put up a cross block. Just like their fight before the first exam the young Kunoichi felt her arms buckle under the intensity of Naruto's strike, as well as the weight of his weapon. Feeling her muscles screaming at her for ordering them to stave off such a heavy load 1010 grunted harshly as she pushed off her kneeling leg to roll out of Naruto's swing path. Quickly moving to her feet the armor-clad girl rushed in to try and keep her opponent on the defensive. Swinging high first with her left hand, 1010 immediately followed suit with a jab from the short blade in her right. Giving herself a silent pat on the back upon noticing she'd gotten inside the blonde's guard that pride quickly turned to surprise when she saw the blow being glanced off, as if hitting against shield. Refusing to let the thought distract her though 1010 10 spun on her foot, and threw out a roundhouse kick. Naruto expertly managed to duck under it though, and even caught the wrist of the arm that swung around next in an attempt to follow up with another horizontal kodeki swipe. Not giving his female opponent the chance to react. The blonde swiftly retaliated with snap kick that sent 1010 10 stumbling back. It was here that Naruto engaged his Zambato's reach and shoved the blade forward. 1010 10 just managed to stumble out of the way, the attack glancing off her chainmail shirt before using her double short swords to block the sweeping slash her hooded opponent attempted next. With her sandal clad feet sliding through the dirt and her blood once again pumping in her ears, the bun haired girl decided that it was time to bring out her secret weapon. Letting Naruto push her away 1010 10 loosened her stance so that her feet carried her that much further back. Once she'd gained enough distance the weapon mistress discarded her latest summon, and replaced it with a standard katana. From his place about 10 yards away Naruto watched as his opponent settled into a stance he'd never seen before. Blue eyes took in the way 1010 10 stretched her left leg out in front, bending it lightly at the knee, while resting her weight on the back leg whose knee angled to support the added pressure. He watched as the armored girl leveled her katana horizontally beside her chest, elbow bent, while her other hand was stretched out with its fingertips resting against the tip of the blade. It was a stance the blonde had never seen before, but if the bun-haired girl's triumphant smirk was anything to go off of, then it was one he would need to learn about quickly or otherwise lose the match. XXX. Back up in the stands many of the veteran shinobi couldn't help being impressed with the level of skill shown by the two genin down below. Unfortunately though, the talks among the group pointed out one major flaw. 1010 has great practical skill guy, but it doesn't look like she puts much thought into planning beyond the moment. The evaluation came from the ever-analytical Kirena. 
The Ruby I Jounin had watched the match from the minute it began up until its current moment and had honestly been overall disappointed with her fellow Kunoichi. She heard that the girl had a goal of becoming a lethal weapon mistress, and in that regard Squad 8's instructor relented she was quickly achieving, but Kirena was disheartened by the fact that brute force seemed to be the only thing Ten Ten seemed capable of. Shaking her head the dress-clad genjutsu mistress relented, she's well on her way to becoming a powerful weapon specialist, as she's shown great aptitude for various types already, but I fear that in her quest she has forgotten there is more to a fight than just swinging a sword. I gotta agree with Kirena on that one followed Asuma your student hasn't shown off any type of ninjutsu or genjutsu. And any teijutsu has only been tied in to combine with her bukijutsu. I'm sorry to say that had Naruto decided to keep his mist going or employed any of the ninjutsu he no doubt has under his belt, your student would have fallen by now. Mike Guy listened to all of this with a stern mask of contemplation on his face. The spandex-clad Teijutsu master knew his fellow Jounin had a point so there was no use arguing with them, but the man did voice his own opinion so as to defend his student's decision. While what you say may be true you forget two things. Both Lee and even Neji employ either complete or nearly complete Teijutsu in battle. Lee has no real chakra potential to speak of and yet managed to stand against a shinobi as powerful as the Keisukeji's son. And in regards to Neji, that boy may channel chakra to his fingertips for a deadlier assault, but we all know that even without the use of that technique he's more than a match for almost all of the other gen in our village has to offer and possibly even some of our greener chunin. Continuing on Guy went on to lay out that while Ten Ten had yet to truly grasp the concept of strategy, she should not be faulted totally for her devotion to Bukijutsu. She very well may not impress the judges this time around but, I believe my student will learn much from her first experience here, and be more than ready to succeed during the next exam. The three other Jounin saw the smile on Guy's face, and were surprised to see the confident look that overtook his thoughtful expression. Each of them could honestly say that the man's belief in his student's potential was one of his greatest qualities. Over in their seats the Jounin that fell under the charge of these Jounin were busy having their own conversation. Wow Shikamari, did you see that punch? Naruto nearly knocked her head off. Choji spattered crumbs onto the floor, as he vocalized his wonder with a mouthful of potato chips. His childhood friend and now teammate looked on at the two genin down in the arena, and couldn't contain his own surprise as he answered back. No kidding. Man what a drag, Naruto went from shrimp to superhuman in the blink of an eye, I don't even recognize him. The dope we left back at the academy would have never come up with the strategy this Naruto did. The Nara heir's words drew the attention of said blonde's female teammate. Sakura was sitting next to Ino, both dressed in civilian clothes as they were merely spectators that day, and had heard what the ponytailed sloth had muttered. What do you mean Shikamari? What did he do? You mean you didn't notice it? The youth in question raised a brow in surprise. However before he could answer the Pinkett's negative head shake with a reply Shikamaru found himself cut off by the second genius of their age group Shino. Izumaki set up a shadow clone outside the stadium and somehow managed to follow it inside without anyone seeing him. He then used the clone to engage Ten Ten in an effort to test her strength before then using his hidden mist technique to allow him the ability to work his way into the battle seamlessly. The plan was quite impressive indeed. Both Kunoichi were equally shocked by this revelation. To the two of them it just didn't seem possible Naruto using strategy. But the praise didn't stop there. And then there's his combat skills, Shikamaru continued, taking over from the young Ibarang. That girl is a whole year ahead of us and yet Naruto, not only caught up to, but is outclassing her in both skill and speed. It's unreal. For many of the ears that listened in Shikamaru Nara's assessment was correct, the Naruto is a Maki everybody had known for so long couldn't be doing any of what the one in the arena was doing. But for one young girl in particular, her fellow clan heir was simply stating facts she'd already known. Hinata Hyuga had absolutely no trouble believing that the blonde who unknowingly held her affections was now skirting around his older opponent so skillfully. For the shy heiress this was all things she had already seen and knew were possible, the fact he was now getting the chance to show this off just meant now others could see what Hinata already idolized. During the preliminary rounds, and even far back enough to the written exam, Hinata had worried about her blonde crush. 
He seemed to have become a totally different person after the academy. No longer did he amble around in his orange jumpsuit or loudly announce his presence to those around him. Instead he had become quieter more calculating and had a certain set in his jaw that Hinata couldn't help to notice. While not sure what had caused it at the time, the shy girl understood immediately what had been the result, Naruto Uzumaki had matured. No longer the pouting boy of days past Hinata looked over the new Naruto with scrutiny as she weighed his changes. And while at first admittedly, she felt the boy she'd grown so fond of had disappeared, Hinata soon realized that all that had really happened was he had evolved into a young man, someone who understood what was asked of him as a shinobi, and was willing to do it. Even if it meant killing, that had been a truly frightening, as well as eye-opening, experience for the pacifistic young girl. Watching the way her crush so easily managed to end that sound shinobi's life had worried her. But what was worse was the look she'd seen in his eyes as he did it. The mesmerizing pools of blue that caused Hinata's heart to race had become cold, rigid cuts of sapphire. For a few moments after that the timid Hugo Eris believed it was the telltale sign that the Naruto she'd originally pined for had died. Until that single moment after her match. Hinata recalled the way he had looked at her as she knelt there on the arena's tile floor. His eyes weren't those of a ruthless killing machine or something equally as savage, but nor were they the joyful and exuberant pair she had grown to dream of. No, the azure gaze that looked upon Hinata after her match was that of the real Naruto, the one she'd seen glimpses of as she watched him train from afar. They were the eyes of the young man who, behind a goofy smile, refused to give up or dishonor his word. They were the eyes that she now saw in her dreams, as she felt her heart fully open to the finally revealed true form of Naruto Uzumaki. Just thinking about the journey her feelings had taken made Hinata try to hide an embarrassed smile. Through her thoughts and evolving feelings the girl realized that, mentally, she too had changed. Now the only question was would Naruto notice, and if so, like the new her. The young heiress didn't get a chance to ponder this thought though as another younger voice made itself known. I know what you guys mean, isn't Oni-san the greatest? All eyes turned in the direction of the voice, and each of the surrounding genin were surprised to find a little girl, covered in scales, sitting just a row above where Sakura Ino and Hinata were sitting. However the shock of the scales was soon replaced when they all recalled something the new girl had said. Oni-san, XXX, back down below Naruto had returned his large blade at its place on his back and then surprised his opponent when he pulled a ninja toe from behind his back. His coat, 1010 realized. The billowing waist length hadn't just been for aesthetic appeal, its true purpose had been to conceal the blonde's secondary weapon. As she watched her hooded opponent settle into the common Ko Gasumi stance the female member of Squad 9 had to admit she was impressed to see the blonde understand that with his limited experience, using the massive Zandato wasn't ideal against a more advanced opponent in a pure clash of steel. Chocolate brown locked with azure blue as both fighters steadied their breathing for what they knew was to be the last round of their match. Confident in her newly acquired Gatotsu 1010 started things off. Digging her sandal clad foot into the dirt she used all the strength she had to push off and then seemed to fly at her blonde target. Naruto was pleased at the level of speed his female adversary moved to engage him. She had obviously been holding back the lion's share of her physical ability. The blonde dared not to blink as he watched the bun-haired girl swiftly closing in on him from underneath his hood. Deciding not to just stand around and wait though, the young Uzumaki let himself rocket forward to meet his new challenge. Steel clanged as both blades scraped against each other. With its longer reach Naruto knew he had to act immediately upon making contact with 1010's katana using his own outstretched blade. Weaving just centimeters underneath the deadly forged steel Naruto could still feel the katana graze his clothed shoulder. Hoping for an opening the blonde swung his arm out to redirect the opposing weapon with his own. From there Naruto spun himself around the girl in front of him so that he faced her back, and then ran his ninja toe forward in an effort to slice through her unprotected forearm. 1010 wasn't going to let this happen though and instead somersaulted forward on the momentum of her opening Gatotsu lunge. Once her feet were back on the ground, the bun-haired Kunoichi jumped forward to re-engage her opponent. Ducking under the blade aimed straight at him, Naruto chanced a stab at his fellow Genin's unprotected inner thigh. This attempt was thwarted as 1010 twisted her body to the left, 
and the blonde's nindito instead grazed off her right thigh protector. Angling her katana to a slant, the armored Kunoichi pushed her blade down in an effort to pierce into Naruto's shoulder. The move proved to be a mistake when the girl's target surprised her by deflecting the strike with his forearm, before taking advantage of her awkward position and managed to slice the flesh of her inner left thigh. Naruto had drawn first blood. Instinct kicked in and Ten Ten's uninjured leg shot out smashing her right knee into Naruto's nose and sending him rolling backwards. In an attempt to capitalize on his down form Ten Ten bit through the hot pain in her leg and rushed after the opponent she just knocked away. Naruto felt his hood fall away as he forced himself to stop, and then threw his arms up, Nindito in hand to deflect the hasty thrust that the brunette in front of him had put together. After that, the blonde felt the heat of battle rush through his veins and dictate his next move. Thrusting out his left hand Naruto demonstrated an ability almost no other shinobi had been capable of and that he himself knew only one of, Jutsu without hand signs. Wind style, great breakthrough. The force of the C-ranked ninjutsu was amplified by the young genin's seemingly endless chakra reserves, and with his mind so focused on the battle now, Naruto had no thoughts about regulating his strength. Ten Ten had no time to even think of avoiding the attack as like an invisible bull, Naruto's technique slammed against her sternum and blasted her through the air before she was left bouncing against the ground like a skipped stone. With his hood down and now pooled at his shoulders Naruto was subjected to the bright rays of the early afternoon sun. Squinting, the blonde looked across the field at his now downed opponent as Ten Ten's body had finally stopped skipping, and was laying in a crumpled heap in the dirt. He along with every other pair of eyes watching, waited with bated breath to see what would happen next. They weren't forced to wait long. Each set of ears in the stadium was trained on the battlefield, and so everyone heard Ten Ten as she groaned in obvious pain. Ten Ten moved her arms in an attempt to push herself up, but quickly threw that idea out as her right arm flared in horrendous pain, it had been broken. At least it matches those ribs he hit the weary Kunoichi thought in a moment of dry humor. Taking further stock of her condition the girl noticed that, during her tumble, her buns had come undone, and her long brown hair was now raining down like a curtain. Ten Ten could also see that one of her pauldrons had shattered on impact with the ground too, and the shoulder that had been hidden underneath now sat dripping blood. These, along with what the girl was sure to be a concussion, were just at the top of the list. Ten Ten could also feel the various bruises forming all across her body, as well as the many smaller scrapes and cuts that she'd sustained during her crash. Knowing there was no way she could continue, even if she wanted to, Ten Ten raised her unbroken hand and flashed the signal for surrender. Just as in the preliminary rounds, Naruto Azumaki walked away with the first victory of the day. Chapter 9 Minus Chunin Exam Finals Show Up or Get Shut Down. XXX. Steel Gray Eyes looked down from the cage's viewing box as their owner, Yurizen Saratobi, watched as one of his subordinates exited the arena after winning his first match. Tipping his hat in an effort to hide his proud smile the Sandime Hokage couldn't help be wowed by the amount of progress his favorite blonde knucklehead had made in the months since he graduated the academy. That boy just might very well take this hat from me after all, the elderly shinobi thought. From the first time he'd heard the boy declare his intentions to become the next Hokage Sarutobi could honestly say he wasn't very impressed. The old man could see the blonde's reasons at the time were purely selfish. And had they still been by the time Naruto was old enough to be considered then the reinstated fire shadow would have denied him the opportunity. But then that escort mission to wave happened, and everything changed. Hiruzen had seen it right away. Something in Naruto's eyes had been different the day Squad 7 reported on their mission success. The elderly Hokage saw a more mature light, and a sense of understanding that hadn't been there when the boy had left both of which had only intensified the next time he'd seen him before the preliminaries. And then he watched Naruto take a life. Seeing the way Naruto seemed to just shrug off ending the Odo Genin's bloody death had frightened the elderly genius. But after he was taken on by Anko, and she assured him that the blonde's mental state was healthy Hiruzen had let out the breath he'd been holding. Naruto was not becoming another Orochimaru. No, if anything I can see bits of his mother in there. It seems like her, he has begun to master the mentality of what it means to be a ninja while understanding how to keep his emotions intact. And while not a genius like Minato, 
the boy truly does have that same raw potential his father was so famous for. Yes here is N could see demonstrated clearly from the match he just witnessed that Naruto as a Maki had truly become a splendid ninja, as well as a credit to what it meant to be a shinobi. And that was why when it came time to offer names to be promoted, he would have no doubts when he voiced his backing for the blonde's advancement. The smile on Hiruzen Saratobi's face was missed by many, but one pair of eyes in particular had caught it immediately. Sitting not five feet away was the Keisuke of Suna, or at least, someone who everyone believed to be Sabaku no Raza. In truth, hidden beneath the man's beady eyes was the snake-like gaze of Orochimaru. The former leaf shinobi eyed his former teacher with distaste, he had never forgiven the man for choosing Minato to be his successor rather than himself. And sitting there, watching the way Sarutobi smiled at the blonde down below, brought back memories of the day Orochimaru would later learn that Hiruzen mentally chose the next Hokage. It was that same smile. And now, knowing what it meant, seeing it set off a raging storm inside the snake summoner. However it also piqued the pale rouge ninja's interest. Because while he may always despise the Yandime for stealing the position Orochimaru felt he himself rightly deserved, let it never be said that the Sanin was unable to appreciate true talent. And from what I can see, the man's serpentine tongue slid over his lips, that boy has truly tremendous talent. Perhaps after the invasion and Kanaha's destruction Orochimaru might even consider keeping the boy to use as the next body after Sasuke. While Ten Ten was being carted away and her weapons retrieved Naruto, made his way back up into the stand so as to wait for his next match. Upon finding his way to the top step the blonde wasn't surprised to catch a flying, violet-haired missile in his arms. Oni-san that was amazing, I knew you would win, but you were great. Naruto chuckled lightly at Aizuribi's excited praise. Giving the girl one last squeeze he pulled back and, taking her scale-covered hand, began to lead her back to her seat. I'm glad you enjoyed the show Aiza-chan, though I wish you hadn't skipped class to come watch me. The girl being admonished turned her bright eyes down bashfully as she replied, I know big brother it's just that I haven't been able to see you because of your missions with Anko-san and, well, I missed you. Aizaribi worried that her Oni-san was going to scold her, and so the little girl couldn't help squeaking in surprise when she instead was hoisted up in his arms and held against his chest. Looking up sharply, the child was again shocked to see that she wasn't in trouble. And I missed you, Naruto reciprocated with a smile, but I told you we would have the next seven days after this to spend together. I'm not mad, I just don't want you skipping the academy, you never know what's being taught, that could very well be important. Understanding the older boy's point and feeling sorry she had disobeyed her guardian Aizaribi's face fell into a look of true sorrow and regret. The scale-covered swimmer hated disappointing Naruto. You're right, Oni-san, I'm sorry. I promise I won't skip again, or at least not unless there's an emergency, okay? Deciding he could live with that the black-clad blonde voiced his agreement. It was by this point that they pair had moved to stand among Naruto's fellow genin, and once inside the gathered circle he noticed the questioning stares. What? Why are you all staring at me? It came to no one's surprise that Ino was the first to break out a question. Who is she and what's with this whole Oni-san business Naruto? Eyeing his fellow blonde Naruto decided that a partial truth would be more than sufficient. Her name is Aizaribi, she's an orphan, like myself, and I chose to take custody of her when I rescued her from a group of bullies. And her skin? This came from Sakura who had no knowledge of anyone in Konoha who had any bloodline that even remotely resembled what the young girl seemed to posses. With how big the world is you can't honestly sit there and tell me that we've really discovered every single Keke, Genkai Sakura. And before anyone even thinks to ask I visit the orphanage often to pass along a percentage of every mission payment I receive to help fund its upkeep, that's how I met Aiza Chan. His logical, albeit snippy, response was enough to quell any more questions about the young girl in the blonde's arms. However this did not account for the topic of the next question, Naruto's unusual level of skill. That curiosity wasn't answered by Naruto though. Instead Anko who had been standing nearby with her fellow Jounin, snaked her way over and while man handled the blonde into a headlock told them that it had been due to her amazing teaching skills. Yep. This little shrimp was only a little garden snake before I came along. Now though, I've evolved him into a lean, mean butt kicking machine, she laughingly finished off. 
It was Shikamaru who finally noticed who she was. Hey wait, aren't you the woman who proctored the second phase of the exams? What are you doing teaching one of the gen and taking it? Ino who while upset she herself hadn't progressed, was still hoping to see both her teammate and of course Sasuke advance. So hearing her fellow clan heir's words quickly got a rise from her. Hey he's right. That should be illegal, and the knucklehead should be disqualified. Surprisingly it was the two teens' own sensei that shot down their argument. If that were really how it works then both Sasuke and Shikamaru would need to be cut as well Eno you know, they received outside help too. Yeah, the ponytailed blonde voiced her understanding, but neither you or Kakashi sensei were proctors in the exam, so it's different. How Eno? You know? This time it was Naruto who answered. What made my situation different, it's not like there was some way for Anko sensei to give me any real way to cheat today. I could see if maybe it had been Asuma sensei or Kirena sensei who helped me and gave me information on how to beat either Shikamaru or Hinata, but that wasn't the case. So what's the problem? For her part Ino could only open and close her mouth in an effort to come up with an answer, while her teammate was quick to see the logic in the explanation he'd been handed. Besides, and no offense to you Anko-sensei, the Tem got personal training from one of our village's most powerful shinobi if anyone's allowance into the exams should be questioned it's his. There's no telling just what Kakashi-sensei might have taught him in the last month. And unfortunately we may not even get to see it, Isuma chimed in again. Because I can see they've finished clearing the field for the next match, and if the kid isn't here by the time Hinata and Neji are finished, he'll forfeit his match by default. All eyes widened at this except for two, the Hyuga pair. Neji's because he could care less what happened to Sasuke. Hinata because in just a few minutes, she would be facing off against her cousin in front of not only thousands of people, but her father and Naruto as well. XXX. Pale, lavender orb stared across the field at pair of eyes almost identical to themselves. The difference being that, the opposite set looked more like rigid cuts of glass than glowing pearls. Hinata held her clan's Teijutsu stance perfectly as she continued her staring contest with Neji. The proctor had signaled the beginning of their match five minutes ago but other than them both settling in, neither Hyuga had physically made a move. Oh sure, Neji had attempted to verbally beat down his opponent. He threw every insult he could get away with at the younger girl in an effort to humiliate her into giving up, but quickly brought that to an end when he noticed it wasn't working. So now, both fighters were at a standstill waiting for the other to make the first move. It was the Hugo genius who cracked first. Angered by his cousin's defiance, as well as refusal to submit, Neji shifted his weight before launching forward to engage Hinata in combat. He would show her why it was foolish to believe she stood any chance of defeating him. For Hinata the look in her cousin's eyes was unsettling, his fury seemed to pulse along the very veins that marked the activation of his Byakugan. But that was nothing compared to the shock that came when it was time to face the older boy's speed. Hinata knew she herself was gifted with an unusual amount of it, but Neji's level of velocity was unlike anything she'd ever seen. Other than the boy Rock Lee, the Hugo heiress was unaware any genin could move so fast. This caused her to blink, and that caused her to experience a pain unlike any she'd ever felt. The sheer force behind Neji's opening palm strike was earth-shattering. Upon impact its target, Hinata was sent back just as 10-10 had been in the match before. However, training with her father allowed the young girl to push aside the pain and get her brain to quit rattling fast enough that she managed to recover. Fighting the force of her launch, Hinata worked herself into a series of back flips before gracefully touching down on the tips of her toes and skidding along the arena floor. Taking in deep breaths through her nose the Hugo heiress winced from the bruise that quickly formed along her stomach. Thankfully there had been no chakra behind the thrust or else Hinata knew the organ hit would have exploded on contact. It seemed, even in his anger, Neji understood the consequences of going too far. And yet, even without the older boy using lethal force Hinata knew that wouldn't stop her cousin from permanently ending her ninja career through other means. Looking up at the teen in question Hinata noticed that Neji had dropped from his stance, he stood hands at his side, with his nose in the air. He was mocking her. The heiress could see it clearly in the older boy's eyes, the Hugo genius did not consider her a threat. 
While at the start of the exams Hinata would have felt shame at this dismissal now the girl only felt anger. The feeling bubbled up inside her, hot like a newly active volcano. She had to work hard to reach the finals, nearly died in the process, and yet here was her cousin acting as if her accomplishment was worth nothing. Hinataka, eyes narrowed at the thought. She would just have to show Neji what she'd learned outside of training with her father. Bringing her hands together the Hugo era surprised many in the stands, as well as her opponent by winding her fingers through a small chain of hand signs. When she finished, all who watched were surprised when the young girl didn't produce any form of attack. Or at least, not one that they could see. Neji on the other hand, was more than aware of what his cousin had done. Hinata's palms now arced with sparks of lightning. Clever, intending to send the jolts into my system via our gentle fist. Unfortunately for you, Lady Hinata, you'll soon find getting within range to perform such a maneuver is impossible. These were the confident thoughts that made their way through Neji's mind as he watched his cousin begin to race towards him. While not on his level, the Hugo genius did admit that the girl's speed was on par with his own female teammate. However to Neji this was the only truly notable skill his cousin owned. Settling into a loose defensive stance the older boy readied himself to begin dodging Hinata's moves. Only to have his eyes widen in astonishment when instead of continuing her charge, the girl stopped short and leapt into the air twisting over her stunned cousin, before landing and planting her palms firmly on the ground. A second later the arena echoed with the cries of Neji's pain. Through the screeching of the white, electric bolts Neji heard Hinata call out her attack lightning style spark trap. The jutsu only lasted all of 5 seconds, but by the time it was over Neji felt as if he'd suffered for hours. The fact that the feeling reminded him of the seal upon his forehead only further served to agitate the festering mental and emotional wounds deep inside scored by events from that night. His body twitching uncontrollably Neji was unprepared for his cousin when she fell upon him again this time with swift strokes of their clan's taijutsu, and so he was only able to jerkingly respond. Neji grit his teeth in fury. He was a genius, fate had chosen him the gift of strength. And yet here was his pathetically weak cousin pushing him onto the defensive. The boy flexed every muscle he could and using his hatred for the girl in front of him to block the pain, now began to deflect her attacks instead of simply dodging. Hinata wasn't distracted by this though. If anything, she'd expected it, the younger girl knew the vile feelings her once gentle cousin held against her and their clan's leader her father. There was no way he was going to make victory easy for her, and would use that hate to keep fighting long after his body wanted to stop. For Hinata that was fine, she wouldn't give up either. Not now, the heiress thought as she ducked under a two-finger jab to her shoulder. Not when Naruto-kun and father are both watching me seeing me. I won't lose here. Using her own feelings to give her strength Hinata pushed back against her cousin's fierce counterattack. The teen's body may have been damaged from her first attack and his power cut, but the Hyuga male was proving his title was well deserved as he showed that even at 70% he was more than capable of keeping up with her. Hinata decided that just meant she had to try harder. The girl's next move came in the form of a sweep kick. Dropping low, the Hyuga heiress whipped her leg around in an effort to knock her cousin's feet from under him. Instead of jump over it, like most, Neji chose instead to move back. Hinata allowed herself a smile as she finished her rotation and then pushed off with the foot that had stayed planted on the ground. Bursting with speed the young girl aimed a palm strike at her cousin's chest. When you older boy deflected it Hinata caught him off guard with a vicious headbutt to his nose. Another shout of pain spewed from Neji's lips, mixing with the blood that flew from his now broken nose. However, this attack used up the last of the boy's patients and he quickly retaliated with an equally brutal right hook. It was Hinata's turn to cry out in pain now as her mouth filled with blood from where she chomped down on her own cheek. Neji's flailed counter-attack sent the indigo-haired heiress stumbling away, nearly tripping over her own feet. With her head fuzzy it was only through the activation of her dajutsu that Hinata managed to avoid the next attack that soon followed the first. Ducking under the open-handed blow meant for her own nose, Hinata let her left hand fly in an attempt to give her cousin a matching bruise on his own stomach. When the boy managed to spin away though Hinata dropped to all fours so she'd avoid a hit to her blind spot, and threw her legs back to try and take out her cousin's knees. 
This proved to be a mistake, as almost immediately Neji revealed his attack to be a feint as he reached out and took hold of his cousin's ankles. Before she could think to free herself Neji showed his strength by heaving his cousin into the air, and then slamming her back into the earth. What nobody, but Hinata realized was that the boy had actually done so much more than that. Crumpled in the dirt the Hugo, heiress silently berated herself for falling into such a trap. Because now, because of her short-sightedness, Hinata found herself unable to control her legs. Her cousin had disrupted the chakra flow in her legs. In a fit of desperation and an effort to bide for time Hinata pulled a handful of shuriken from her hip pouch and sent them whizzing through the air in her approaching opponent's direction. Neji was forced to jump aside due to his closer proximity, and so Hinata used that time to push up onto shaky legs. Thankful that it had only been a momentary disruption, and that Neji hadn't had time to fully close any of her tenkatsu, Hinata took several jumps back so as to widen the distance between herself and the Hugo genius. But Neji saw this for what it was and wasn't willing to give the girl even a moment of respite. Using his extreme levels of speed the older boy, even in his weakened condition, managed to close the gap between himself and his prey with ease before swiftly laying into her with a fast-paced gentle fist assault. Hinata did her best to defend while trying not to engage her legs, but found the feet easier said than done. In her mind her thoughts screamed for her to lash out with kicks and sweeps, but logic forced its way through and told her that doing so would only unbalance her and leave large openings for Neji to actually shut down her chakra then she'd really be in trouble. So with her breath coming in gasps, Hayashi's daughter weaved and slid her torso around each of her hateful foe's onslaught of jabs and palm strikes. Until finally, the muscles in her legs jolted, and she swung her right leg around in a ferocious roundhouse kick. The speed of the attack, coupled with the surprise factor, allowed Hinata to force Neji into blocking it with his forearms. And while strength wasn't the petite Kunoichi's greatest attribute the simple fact that her opponent hadn't expected the move afforded Hinata the chance to make Neji stumble. However instead of pressing her attack, the female Hyuga chose that moment to put distance between herself and her fellow clan member. XXX. Up in the stands many of the spectators were confused by what they'd just seen, why hadn't Hinata continued her counter strike? To find the answer, the more observant minds turned to the girl's Jounin instructor. What kind of technique did you teach her? Anko asked with a raised eyebrow. Kirena merely smiled proudly and gave an off-handed shrug. A little of this, a little of that, maybe a couple of genjutsu for good measure. You know me Anko, I like my students to be well-rounded. The special Jounin smirked playfully at her female friend and sucked her teeth. TCH. I think someone's a little too high up on her horse you don't really think your girl's got a chance to win do ya? I mean, I heard this Neji kid's pretty good. If she continues like she has I'd say it's more than a chance, the ruby-eyed beauty countered. Anko wanted to retort, she really did, but was interrupted by a chuckle from Asuma. Turning her eyes onto the bearded young Saratobi she asked, What's so funny Smokey? Oh you'd be laughing too if you'd seen what hand signs she just used. Look. And so she did. And Anko laughed too. The land of fire truly deserved its name. XXX. Fire style, Phoenix Flower Jutsu. During her training outside the compound with Kirena the very first act of the girl's training had been to learn her elemental affinities. The Genjutsu mistress had stressed that Hinata learn techniques she could use from a distance, as there would be times she either wouldn't be able to get up close, like her fight with Zaku, or she'd need to keep someone away like with Neji. When introduced to the chakra paper both women were surprised to find that while the Hugo heiress had the usual connection to fire she also had one with lightning. A rare occurrence in their homeland. After that first day Hinata and her Jounin instructor worked to round out the younger girl's rigidly trained skill set. Working to include a handful of lower rank jutsu that required only minimal amounts of chakra as well as a number of genjutsu that could be performed without straining what reserves she'd have left. Besides that the two kunoichi brainstormed ways to combine the techniques into useful strategies, and by the end of the month both women felt confident in Hinata's ability to defeat her cousin. Watching the fist-sized balls of fire sail through the open air towards Neji Hinata hoped she'd bought a moment to think on what her next move should be. 
Her mind working fiercely, all the Hugo girl's thoughts ground to a halt when her Bakugan registered something unbelievable Neji performing the Caden. Both Eris and Clan Head had to fight their own reaction of dropping their jaws to the floor, as they watched a member of the lower house perform such an advanced technique. For Haishi it was like a slap in the face to see someone not of the main branch using the Hayuga's ultimate defense while for his daughter it showed that there truly were those within her own family that wished to see her fail, as only a main branch member could have taught Neji that move. By the time her cousin had stopped spinning Hinata realized her own mistake, and once again berated herself for letting Neji get ahead of her, she was supposed to use that time to mold Chakra for a Genjutsu. Knowing what another jutsu like that would do to her reserves Hinata decided it was better to work with what she had, and instead be thankful that it had at least drawn out her opponent's trump card, and gotten her back into position to spring her trap. For Neji it was like the world's worst insult to his skills that the match had progressed the way that it had, and even worse that he had been forced into using his secret weapon so soon. Elder Shu would not be pleased. Staring down his smaller cousin, Neji growled low in his throat, all pretense of being the cool and collected warrior gone. It was time to end the match. Knowing he had more energy left than his cousin, it being the main reason he himself didn't use ninjutsu, Neji decided that there was no point in trying to conserve now. Recalling the basic methods of chakra enhancement that came from the tree and water walking exercises Neji channeled the flow of his own into the muscles in his legs before dropping into a runner's pose and then shooting forward like a comet. Hinata didn't stand a chance. Before the girl could blink, Neji was on her. In a blurring visage of speed the Hugo warrior sent finger jabs and palm strikes into every one of his cousin's loose defensive stance. It was only seconds before he'd shut down every tenkatsu and left Hinata with nothing. The young Kunoichi was quickly made helpless. But Neji didn't stop there. Whenever Hinata attempted any sort of defense her opponent used that as an excuse to release even more of his inner hatred. If a hand came up, the arm it was attached to was twisted behind her back and quickly broken. Whenever the girl tried to duck or dodge away the attack was turned into a spot on feint and her head was knocked around by a swift follow-up. By the time Neji was through and sent Hinata flying back with a final palm strike, Many onlookers feared for the knowingly delicate girl's ability to handle such treatment. From her place on the ground Hinata wheezed out short, raspy breaths as she struggled to lift her battered form. Neji had used more than just the gentle fist. The Hugo heiress could feel that some of her ribs had indeed been broken by blunt elbow strikes, while her normally cute button nose was now swollen and crooked from being broken. Aside from that, and her broken arms that begged to be left alone, Hinata counted that the only real damage was her entire body slowly turning black and blue. And for her, that was good enough. With her dajutsu still active Hinata could see her bones, could see where and how they'd been broken. So biting down on the shoulder of her heavy jacket the girl proceeded to shove her bones back into place. Tears welled in her eyes, but the girl refused to let them fall. There would be time for that later. Once it was over though Hinata went on to do the same thing with her nose, the sharp, gross realignment of bone sending shudders through all non-shinobi in the arena. Knowing there was nothing she could do about her ribs without proper medical jutsu though, Hinata let herself fall back into her teijutsu stance and stare into the disbelieving eyes of her cousin. I hope that wasn't all you had Neji because if it is, I suggest you quit. For the young teen in question the taunt only made him angrier. Who did this pampered weakling think she was talking to? Flooding his legs with chakra and sending it to the bottoms of his feet, Neji prepared to launch into another fearsome display of power. Until the ground beneath him exploded. Hinata had quickly brought her hands together and flashed a single seal release. To many of the audience this was confusing, but those who had paid attention during the beginning of the match only smiled as they watched Hinata's plan unfold. Her first jutsu had been a distraction, she'd laid a high-level explosive tag in the dirt. Now, with them back to where they'd started and Neji having flared his chakra, the seal was charged and had been set off. The result? All eyes watched as the Hugo genius was literally blown sky-high before he came back down for a painful landing. XXX. That was pretty impressive. The praise came from Naruto's own mouth as he watched the match below, Aizaribi cuddled against his chest. What did she do? Questioned Sakura. I've never heard of a jutsu like that one before. 
Shikamaru eyed the pink kit from his peripheral vision. Because it wasn't a Jutsu Sakura, Hinata set a trap for Neji during the first few minutes of the battle. Something I'm sure she picked up from you, Naruto. And if she did, the blonde in question had a single eyebrow raised as if to ask, did the move not work? Sighing in resignation, Shikamaru relented and said, What a drag, we don't need two of you running around Naruto. One knucklehead is enough. I still don't get it Shika, Ino interrupted the boys. What trap did Hinata set up, and when did she do it? During the time she electrocuted her cousin, Naruto answered for the lazy Nara. Her lightning jutsu was a two-pronged attack. First, it weakened Neji on a physical level, bringing him down enough that Hinata could keep up, and second she buried an explosive note into the ground that would set off when it interacted with a burst of chakra. Ino and the others who hadn't figured out what had happened couldn't help being amazed. The plan, while ultimately simple, was still brilliant. The explosion wasn't predetermined either, Shino threw in. The Abarain was proud of his teammate and wished to further boast her ingenious plot. Hinata deliberately left the note uncharged because she wanted it to react instantly when hit with chakra thus allowing for the large explosion. Neji attempted to push an enormous level of power into his lower body, and instead powered the seal under his feet. And now the guy's even more banged up because of it, finished Naruto. Sakura and her blonde seat mate understood now what had happened, and could only look on in wonder as they realized the same thing. The winner would be whoever could withstand their injuries the longest. XXX. Back in the stadium both Hyuga members glared at the other. Neji had managed to summon the strength needed to stand on his shredded, blood-covered legs while Hinata hunched to alleviate the pain in her broken ribs. Both knew that this was it. Once they started, it would only end when one of them was passed out on the ground, or too broken to continue. Neji had the chakra to go on for hours, but his body was thrashed, while Hinata's body was in better shape, but she herself had very little energy left. This is it, they both thought, it all ends here. Pushing off both Hyuga rushed to engage their opponent. Hinata struck first. The struggling Kunoichi threw a palm strike out in an effort to end the match quickly, but missed her mark when Neji swerved out of the way. Dodging his cousin's attack cost the battered genius though, and his quick movement caused Neji to stumble over his own feet. Fighting to stay on his feet the young shinobi pedaled backwards, giving him the added bonus of putting distance between Hinata and himself. Even with her Bakugant Hugo, Eris found that her vision had begun to blur, a sure sign of exhaustion, both of the physical and chakra variety. But, refusing to quit, Hinata chose instead to turn her Dajutsu off to conserve her rapidly draining energy supply before balling up her small fists and rushing back in to face her cousin. From there the battle devolved more into a brawl. Neji still had the energy to put into using his gentle fist so he opted for it whenever possible some moves being beyond his current physical condition. The labeled genius managed to duck or outstep more than most of Hinata's flailing fists, but found himself hard-pressed to mount any real offense. And yet it seemed, in the end, that such a thing would not be needed. Hinata tried. The girl gave everything she had left to throw in a last-ditch effort to slug her cousin in the face only to overreach and stumble as she lost her center. With no energy to catch herself and gravity working against her, the young heiress dropped like a puppet without strings. Clattering to the ground in a beaten heap Hinata chalked on dust as she gasped for air. Standing over her, Neji looked down at his defeated cousin with contempt for all that fire you had in your eyes, and all your training you continued to forget that our battle was already predetermined. Fate had long ago decided that I would be victorious today, while you, cousin, would fall in defeat. You lose. Hinata wanted to fight, wanted to stand up, and prove that Neji's words weren't true. But she just didn't have the strength. Her body ached as if she'd been beaten by a bat, and her eyelids hung heavy as the girl fought to even stay conscious. It broke the young heiress heart, but there was no denying it. She'd lost. And even with the knowledge that her father and the one she loved could see it, the simple fact that she'd failed in front of those azure eyes made Hinata Hugo cry. XXX. Neji's eyes watched for a moment as Medic Ninja hauled his battered cousin away on a gurney. He looked on for a few seconds before turning his gaze upwards toward the stands. Finding his target, the Hugo male locked eyes with an older, sharper pair of lavender orbs. 
Hayashi Hyuga was looking down at him with a blank stare. And yet, for all the stern and steel that the Hyuga patriarch possessed, Neji was able to see the signs that told him there would be terrible punishment awaiting him at home. Years of living under the same roof with another person did wonders for one's powers of observation, especially when you had to actively search for emotional tells. But despite knowing these things the thrashed young man felt no fear as he finally broke eye contact with his uncle, Genma shooing him away to clear the field for the next match. No, instead the prodigious warrior found that his mind was instead centering on the older man's daughter. Or more specifically, the loss he'd almost suffered at her hands. Because while it would be nice to say that he'd had everything under control, and that everything that went on had all been part of a predestined cat and mouse game that faded Neji as the winner, a small part of Neji found itself doubting such a belief. And how could it not when for a moment, no matter how short it was Neji Hyuga truly felt as if he might lose. But then that couldn't be true, could it? He, Neji Hyuga, prodigy and genius of the Hyuga clan, could never be defeated by self-pitying heiress. Could he? XXX. Naruto watched as Squad 8's Jown and instructor hurriedly exited the stands with Shino following close behind. Seeing this made the blonde smile with the knowledge that Hinata had people who cared about her well-being. Especially when he could see from the corner of his eye, that none of the Hyuga sitting in their special box, so much as twitched while watching their clan member get wheeled away. However, thinking of Shino's departure made Naruto voice a question asking for Kiba's whereabouts. I couldn't tell you Choji answered. He usually joins me and Shiko for lunch when we're all still in the village but after what happened with Akamaru neither of us have seen him. This was the response he got from the other genin that surrounded him as well. And that fact worried him. Naruto could easily recall the unbridled, animalistic rage that Kiba had fallen into after his partner's death, and could only hope that wherever the Inuzuko was he wasn't thinking of doing anything drastic. The blonde's thoughts were halted though when Rock Lee, who was just now hobbling up the steps, voiced a question of his own. Since it seems the topic of discussion is wayward teammates I must ask you, Naruto-san, where is yours? Drawing attention to the Uka's absence made Naruto realize that two of the first round matches had come and gone. Meaning Sasuke's was next. Turning his eyes on the crutch-bearing Teijutsu user the black-clad blonde answered that he didn't know. The temp took off with Kakashi-sensei almost immediately after the preliminary rounds, stopping only for a minute to get checked over by a nurse. After that, I have no clue what happened to him. Here Naruto let his eyes drift over to Sakura, one thing I am sure of though is, if he's not here soon he'll be disqualified. Not surprisingly it was Ino who spoke up in the boy's defense. They wouldn't do that, she she barked. Who do you think all these people came to see? Certainly not Shikamaru, or those losers from Suna. I'd be careful who you're calling loser, little girl, especially when you yourself didn't even make it to the finals. The voice belonged to Temurai, eldest of the Suna siblings. The fan-wielding beauty sent a sneer in her fellow blonde's direction before continuing. And besides, it's like I told you girls before, just because his last name is famous or his eyes see better than others doesn't make him any more important than the streak over here. All eyes turned in the direction Temurai had pointed her thumb and were surprised to find it jabbed in Naruto's direction. Naruto himself asked the question that was on their minds, the streak. Frost green eyes crinkled as their owner gave a playful smirk. Temurai placed a hand on her cocked hip and replied, That's what Baki my Jounin instructor, was calling you to my father when he arrived last night. It seems your speed impressed him. Oh. Naruto raised a single eyebrow in response. And what exactly do you think about the name? Temurai, the sandy blonde finished the lead Naruto had left. And I'm curious to know what business is it of yours what I think about it? A playful smirk slid its way onto Naruto's face. I only ask because for you to have heard the name you would need to eavesdrop on that particular conversation, which begs the question what about me is so interesting to you. Many eyes watched the battle of words, but few could believe what they were seeing. For those who knew and had spent time with Naruto found it hard to accept, while those who'd only heard of him watched in fascination. Naruto, the Zamaki looked like he was flirting. And from the pink glow that now highlighted Subaku no Temuri's tan cheeks, it seemed he was succeeding. 
However, Tamarai would not be unbalanced so easily. Taking a few steps forward in an effort to use her superior height to rack the boy's nerves, she answered, Well, how else was I gonna know if you were really worth my time? Teal met Blue as neither Naruto or Tamarai let themselves back down. For the Leaf Shinobi, it was a matter of fun. He'd never had such an experience before and it was doing something to his pulse that he liked. For the Sand Kunoichi it was a test to see if the boy in front of her could be what she was looking for as none of the ones at home ever piqued her interest. No, neither one would let themselves back down. But someone else had another idea. Hey, don't give my big brother that look lady, he'll knock you into next week, if you even think about fighting him. Izaribi's shout at such close range jolted both blondes from their staring contest. Temurai leaned back, blinking when she realized just how close she'd gotten before looking down her nose at the little girl she finally noticed was in Naruto's arms. Big brother. Fight him. Oh you don't have to worry about that kid, I don't know if I have it in me to mar your Oni-san's handsome face. Laughter rumbled in Naruto's chest as he watched Aiza-chan stick her tongue out in response to that remark. But then the sandy blonde's words worked their way to his brain, and the sword-wielding Azumaki let another grin find its way to his face. Just as your big brother doesn't think he'd be capable of ruining such a beautiful desert flower with such a barbaric activity, Aiza-chan. Then, turning his attention back to the older girl in front of him Naruto went on to say, but I would like to get to know that flower a little better. If she's interested. Every pair of eyes that was watching nearly shot from their sockets. Had they really just seen that? Naruto Izumaki resident head of Sakura Haruo's fan club for the last four years had just asked another girl on a date. There was only one thing any of them were thinking at the moment, it was a good thing Hinata wasn't there to see it. On her end Tamurai was caught a little off guard. In truth, she hadn't expected the boy to push so far this fast. Because while the Sunakunoichi knew she'd like to at least go on one date with him, the sandy blonde also understood that that wasn't a real possibility. Because any minute now her father would give the signal, and Temurai would become part of an invasion force designed to destroy Konoha. A force that could very well kill the boy in front of her. And yet, despite this, Temurai found her lips moving before she could stop herself. I'd like that, Naruto-kun. XXX. The crowd is getting restless, thought Sarutobi. The elderly Hokage looked out over the thousands of faces that filled his village's stadium and could clearly see despite his age that each and every one of them was upset. As well they should be though, since the last time they'd seen anything exciting was 10 minutes ago. Neji and Hinata's match had been well and over with, and since there was nothing to clean up Genma announced the next match immediately after both fighters had left the arena. It was understandable, even more so when one considered the amazing battles that had just taken place, and the hype that had been whispered about the strength of Sasuke Uchiha. So when the young man in question's match arrived, and he was nowhere to be found, many onlookers quickly became unsettled. It had been 10 minutes since the match was called. Where was Sasuke? Here is Saratobi sighed in exasperation, he was afraid this would happen. Kakashi had allowed his tardiness rear its head at the worst possible time and, in doing so, now put the Sandime in a terrible position. He would have to disqualify the Uchiha heir. The Keisuke had spoken up within the first few minutes of the wait, when Hiruzen was originally going to voice his decision, and convinced his fellow village leader to stave off such a declaration for a few more minutes. Look at all of those people out there Sarutobi think of how far they've traveled, and all for the chance to see young Sasuke in action against my son. Why deprive them of that? At first the Sarutobi clan's leader was in a begrudging agreement. He had had numerous and relay the various whispers of excitement around the village, all centered on Sasuke. And it had been that memory that kept the old man from dismissing his fellow cage's plea. But this was just ridiculous. After all, what kind of message did this send to prospective clients? Who would hire Leaf Shinobi if they had to worry about their help arriving too late? The village could not afford such a reputation, especially with their demo present. No, there was only one thing to do. XXX. Sakura Haruo couldn't believe her ears. Sasuke was disqualified. There was no way. It had to be a mistake. The Hokage wouldn't really do that, would he? 
Not after everything Sasuke went through and all the training he no doubt underwent in order to prepare for this day. Sasuke couldn't be disqualified, he just couldn't. And yet, as she listened to the proctor down below call for the next two participants, the pinkette was numbly forced to face the truth. Her Sasuke kun had been cut from the tournament. W what just? Why did he do that? Why did the Hokage disqualify Sasuke kun you guys? Looking around Sakura could see that while Ino was in a similar state of shock, the rest of the rookies that stood around her just seemed to shrug off the fact one of their own had been deprived the chance to obtain the rank of Chunin. Even Naruto remained silent. And that angered her. Eyebrows knitting together Sakura jumped from her seat and swiftly stepped in front of her blonde teammate. With arms flinging, she asked why he wasn't upset like her. Because the Hokage made the right decision Sakura everyone, including Naruto, knows that. The answer came from Lee. The boy with the large eyebrows hobbled over on his crutches, body still tender from opening so many gates and further explained why her raven-haired love interest had been let go. For the Hokage to wait any longer, and even then waiting beyond perhaps a minute, could be seen as favoritism. That is something a cage cannot allow. To do so would damage, not only his her own reputation, but also the villages as a whole. When it looked like Sakura was going to argue it was Asuma who spoke up next, the Jounin present all having listened in. As troublesome as you may find it Sakura, Lee is right. And it's not only the dangers of favoritism that Lord Hokage has to worry about there's also the business aspect as well. What client is going to send missions to a village that they think won't respond to them in a swift fashion? Like Lee just said, already waiting longer than a minute was bad enough, but 10. This tournament has been marked on people's calendars for weeks Sakura Naruto finally chimed in. However as he answered his eyes were on the arena, watching Shikamaru attempt to defeat Tamurai. With that being the case, and everybody knowing the time it started, what excuse could Sasuke possibly give for not being here? If this had been a mission, like the one we took months ago to wave, I don't think the people needing Sasuke's help would be satisfied with sorry, I got lost on the road of life. But Sasuke-kun Isakura tried to defend her other male teammate only to be cut off by a cold sharp voice. A coward. Gera's presence sent chills down the spines of many who saw him. Naruto was forced to tighten his hold on Aizaribi as she curled closer to him in fear. Ino who had the unfortunate pleasure of being still being seated found herself less than two feet away from the frightening red head. The platinum blonde could feel her palms sweat and her legs turn to jelly as she croaked out, H how C can you s say that? Ino thanked every god she knew when Gara answered her without looking in her direction. Because that's what he is. The Achiha knew I was to be his opponent today, and so he refused to show up. That makes him a coward. And not worth my time. The chill that frosted over Gera's words kept even Sakura's usual defensive rant silent. See green eyes blinked once before turning to look at Naruto. Gera's posture straightened just so, his shoulders shifting before he hissed at the blonde. But you Naruto is a Maki, I can feel the power that leaks free. Killing you is sure to prove my existence? It seemed that was all the redhead wanted to say because almost immediately after Gara turned and walked away. Yet, even with his departure, all those he left behind could still feel the goosebumps raised against their skin. There was something not right about Sabaku no Gara. Aizaribi shook in fright, the boy with the gore terrified her. Instinct dictated she find comfort in who she saw as the strongest. Turning her teary eyes upward, the trembling academy student whimpered to draw her big brother's attention. When those caring blue eyes were on her eyes, Aribi managed to squeak out, Oh, Oni san, you'll be beat him right. Why you won't leave me alone, will you? Naruto immediately set to comforting the little child in his arms. Holding her as close as possible, the blonde ducked eyes, Aribi's head under his chin before he slowly started to rock her. Of course, I'll beat him, Isa chan. I promised you I'd never let you feel that loneliness again, and you know your Oni-san never goes back on his word. Let's just hope this time you haven't bitten off more than you can chew. The voice was one that Naruto hadn't expected to hear. Turning his eyes keeping his head still, the blonde locked into a stare down with Shikamaru. Looking over the spelt older boy Naruto saw that the Nara air was covered in scrapes, 
while his over shirt had been lost in his match with Temurai. Finishing the signs of battle off was a healthy coat of dust and dirt. So, the cloaked Jennings rolled out, you gave up didn't you? It wasn't a question Naruto knew that Shikamaru wasn't interested in winning the tournament. So when the pineapple-headed shinobi shrugged, the blonde couldn't help scoffing out a laugh. Which means you're up next, Sakura lightened up. The pinkette had recovered from the previous encounter with Gara and was eager to get her mind focused on something else. And with how battered Neji is from his fight with Hinata there's no way you'll lose. And he didn't. Because Neji wound up forfeiting. This surprised all who knew the cocky Hyuga, but what they didn't know was that Neji had used the whole of Shikamaru's match with Temurai to think on how to handle Naruto. The young prodigy quickly came to the conclusion that, in his current condition, there was no way he could defeat Naruto as a Maki. Neji's cold, calculating stare had kept the blonde in their sights, and took in how the cloak covered Jenin stood. What the older boy found cemented his decision. As a member of the Hyuga clan, Neji had an innate ability to read the body language of any one individual. It was with this power of observation that let Neji know Naruto had yet to use even half of his strength. The blonde wasn't even breathing hard. After witnessing the amount of skill the younger Jenin possessed without being pushed, Neji was able to come to a rough estimate of Naruto Uzumaki's true strength. One on one, both at 100%, Neji believed he had a chance to win. But as it stood, with him standing on tattered legs and a debilitating concussion, the Hugo genius knew he stood no chance. Proctor, he called out form his place in the stands, I choose to forfeit. Far better to concede looking smart than lose in a humiliating beatdown. A trending thought it seems because Temurai was quick to voice her own removal from the tournament after that. Her opponent having been her younger brother. All eyes popped when they realized what this meant, Naruto was now left to face Gara. I'd anticipated this end, Naruto thought begrudgingly, I just didn't expect it to be so soon. Apparently this was the right move for the crowd, because when the blonde kissed her cheek and set Aizuribi down, and started to descend the stairs, he was followed by thunderous applause. The whole time Naruto kept his eyes locked on Gara, who had shunshined into the field via a whirlwind of sand. Moving to the center of the battleground Naruto stood only a handful of feet away from someone he knew would kill him if given the chance. There would be no warm-up. There would be no breaks. Naruto steeled his nerve before nodding to Genma that he was ready. Then let the final match of the Chunin exams begin. Before the special Jounin could move out of the way though two things happened. First, Naruto beat the man to the punch and shot back five yards. Second, Kakashi and the missing Sasuke appeared in a whirlwind of leaves. The entire stadium had been supercharged by the explosive way Naruto had reacted, moving faster than a veteran shinobi, so when their exciting spectacle was ground to a halt many of them took to voicing their displeasure. Something that came as a surprise to an incredulous-looking Kakashi and Sasuke. Hey, get out of the way. We want to see some action, get off the field. You had your chance kid, now move. But what really shook the pair was when a female voice, one that Ino and Sakura recognized as Amy shouted, your old news Uchiha. Now you and the scarecrow get your butts off the field so Naruto can cream this guy. For those that knew the girl couldn't believe their ears. She had been one of Sasuke's biggest followers back in the academy, vehemently defending the Uka's name against every type of slander. So for the Kunoichi washout to now dismiss Sasuke with that same enthusiasm, while simultaneously uplifting Naruto, caused many of their jaws to drop. When Kakashi finally managed to snap himself out of his stupor the elite Jounin turned his lone eye up in the direction of the cage box. With a look of confusion he asked, Hokage-sama, what's going on? I thought Gara was to be Sasuke's opponent. He was, Genma answered for the elderly shinobi. But when your student wasn't present at the time of his match Lord Hokage had him disqualified. Hearing this got a look of disbelief from the Uchiha in question. That look soon morphed into a scowl as he eyed his Jounin instructor. You said that they would push my match back if I wasn't on time Kakashi. It's the only reason I let you talk me into resting after our spar. I, I assumed they would Sasuke was the man's muttered reply. We will be speaking in my office once the exams are over you too, the Sandime called down from his seat. This behavior is unacceptable, and I won't have it repeated. 
But for now you'll need to remove yourselves from the field as Naruto and the Keisuke's son are due to round out the tournament. With the dismissal of the Hokage both Kakashi and an irate Sasuke began the walk towards the staircase. The Achiha heir desperately wanted to argue, but knew better than to do so in front of so many people. Making demands out loud or even bailed, would not be tolerated by any shinobi no matter what name they carried. Once the two made their exit Genma signaled for the match to resume. XXX. Up in his seat, Orochimaru was not a happy man. After that fool Kakashi sealed the curse mark he placed on Sasuke the Sanin was eager to see how well the boy fared without the added power. He'd seen it before back during the preliminary rounds, and could barely contain himself at such a delicious outcome, the inverted Sharingan. Never in his wildest dreams had Orochimaru expected his personal seal to be able to amplify the already tumultuous power of the Uchiha clan's bloodline. Watching the power explode from Sasuke had sent shivers down his spine. With the curse mark's power being rooted to the boy's eyes, there was none of the messy chakra expulsion that accompanied its use by the sound four. No, in fact, Orochimaru watched as even his old sensei had been unable to detect the vile ink that coursed through the last Uka's veins when he faced the Inuzuka boy. But the snake Sanin knew, and it pleased him greatly. Enough that he didn't even worry about Kakashi's laughable attempt to interfere with his plan. Since then Orochimaru imagined what sort of explosion would occur when Sasuke willingly chose to activate his now repressed seal. The Rouge Ninja could see in his mind's eye how the raw, unrestrained power would visibly flare from Sasuke's Sharingan, and licked his lips in pure hunger at just how it would feel to bear witness to the Uka's further descent into darkness. It was why he had so eagerly desired the chance for the Jinchuriki of Suna to be the boy's opponent so as to force Sasuke to use his power, but now it seems Orochimaru would have to wait. And even with the invasion set to begin soon, needing only word from his summon team from beyond the walls, Orochimaru was not a patient man. The Sanin hated waiting. Anger was the minority emotion at the moment, as aside from the disguised Orochimaru, the only other person feeling it was Sasuke. The young clan heir strode over to his fellow Genin with his arms crossed and his jaw clenched. There was no denying where the boy would rather be at the moment. It was as he and his instructor got closer that Sakura decided she would be the first to greet them or rather, to chastise Kakashi for his foolishness. Kakashi-sensei, what in the world were you thinking? What made you believe that letting Sasuke-kun be late for his was okay? Asuma followed the girl's lead. Your student beat me to it, but I'm curious myself Kakashi, did you really think dad was just gonna let the kid slide? Scratching his neck in embarrassment, the Jounin in question gave his response. Honestly yes. I figured with everything I was hearing around the village that everyone wanted to watch Sasuke showcase his abilities. And to me, that just translated to them willing to wait until he was ready to fight. But they weren't, Sasuke growled. And now I've lost my chance to become a Chunin. In an attempt to settle her crush's obviously boiling temper Sakura got up from her seat and, walking over to him softly placed her hand on his shoulder. It'll be alright Sasuke-kun. This isn't the only way to be promoted, you'll still have your chance. What are you talking about Sakura? What other way is there besides the exams? Smiling softly at the raven-haired boy's confusion Sakura offered a reply. It's something called in-in-field promotion. Genin can be promoted to Chunin through their performance on a mission, the same thing can be done to become a Jounin, but that usually only happens during times of war. And just how do you know about this? The Uka's question came with an eyebrow raised in disbelief. Sakura dropped her hand from its perch and looked down sheepishly. Well, I know I didn't do so well in the exams, and I was worried about being stuck as a genin until the next year, so I did some research during the month you and Naruto were training. With a sense of hope welling in his stomach Sasuke turned to look at the Jounin present and asked if what Sakura said was true. More or less, answered Asuma. Besides, most villages' ranks are swelled with Chunin. If the only way to be promoted was through some series of biannual tests, we'd be stuck with hundreds of Genin. Our ranks are filled with Chunin? Ino questioned from her seat. Da Ino, Shikamaru told her. What? Did you think everyone wailing around with a flak jacket was a Jounin? The platinum blonde's eyes blazed with feminine fury, and what if I did you lazy buffoon? 
Then it means our academy needs a reboot, snorted Anko as she entered the conversation. Beside her both Kirena and Shino walked onto the scene. The trio had gone to check on Hinata after her defeat at Neji's hands, Anko leaving later to support her friend. After learning from the medics that the Hugo Eris condition was non-life-threatening they made their way back up to the stands and walked in on the current conversation. For the past few years each major ninja village has been made up of roughly 1500 to 2000 shinobi, Konoha holding the largest at 2500 and Suna the lowest at a little less than a thousand. Of those numbers, only a small handful are Jounin, the reason being because of the immense level of skill and sheer power required as well as leadership capability. The rest of the force is made up primarily of Chunin and the last percentage being Jenin. What about the Anbu? This question came from Sakura. Kakashi took over from Anko at this point. The Anbu make up a very small number of the ninja inside a village, their own numbers not usually exceeding two handfuls, or roughly 20 shinobi. However these men and women are not counted among the roster as it is based on wartime account. The Anbu are never put on the front lines. How come, Ino asked. If the Anbu are meant to be the most skilled ninja in a village under its cage, why wouldn't they be used in war? Kirena shook her head as she picked up the lesson. It's not that they're never used, Eno, just the opposite, actually. Andu are used heavily in times of war, the difference between them and us being, their assignments are restricted to assassination and sabotage. Very rarely would you see Andu in open combat, as their skills are needed for more pressing missions. The Genin all listened in rapt attention. At least until Anko's loud voice drew them away. How come nobody came and told me my kid was up next? And he's going up against that freaky sand kid? This is gonna be great. The woman's excitement seemed to leak from her every pore as she leaned over the railing for a better look at the battlefield. Her eager exclamation snapped the rest of the group back into real time, as they all remembered that there was still one more match to watch. Down below Naruto eyed his opponent wearily. The redhead hadn't moved a muscle since the start of the match, while Naruto himself had settled into a strong defensive stance. Forgoing his heavy Zandato at the moment the blonde instead tried to come up with a way to get past the shield of sand he knew would spring up if he got too close. Well, there is one thing I could try Naruto thought before he brought forth his hands to forge a hand sign. Only to stop so he could catch the cork that rocketed towards his face. Azure eyes watched as sand slowly snaked its way out of the gourd on Gera's back. The earthly particles rose into the air and formed a cloud. Before a volley of sand needles burst forth and raced through the air, their target being Naruto. The blonde swordsman jumped to the side so as to avoid being skewered, all the while keeping his eyes on his opponent. This proved to be the right move because as soon as his feet had left the ground, a fist of earth burst out of the ground, and tried to smash the cloak-covered Genin. Nimbly, Naruto twisted around the oncoming attack and sent a hail of shuriken that he pulled from his pouch at Gara. Predictably every one of the throwing stars was halted by a wall of sand, but this was what Naruto had wanted. When raised in defense Gara's sand blocked his view of whatever was in front of him. Using this to his advantage Naruto quickly summoned the necessary chakra, and then seemed to simply vanish. He used the hidden chameleon jutsu that Anko had shown him during their first mission together. Once that was done he molded his chakra, and began to summon his mist. This match wasn't a game, and Naruto knew he needed to end it as quickly as possible. Gera's normally impassive facade crinkled into a look of annoyance when his sand dropped to the floor, and he was met with a strange, but interesting sight. Naruto, Izumaki was gone. The redhead could find no trace of his fellow Genin, and to top it off, a heavy mist was settling onto the field. Just as Gara thought about how interesting his new prey was his sea green eyes widened a fraction in surprise when the barest traces of heat washed over his back. His sand had just stopped a fireball from scorching him. Turning his head in the slightest, the Keisuke's son looked again for his blonde foe. The mist had stopped growing, leaving just enough visibility to see a few feet ahead. Naruto was not in range of Gera's sight. A shadow had Gera's eyes snapping to the corners of their sockets. From his peripheral vision the Suna native caught just a glimpse of something moving through the fog, its speed removing it from sight just as quickly as it came. 
The red head still sent a powerful blast of sand barreling forward though. The pillar of sand crashed harmlessly into the earth. Gara knit his brow together in the barest hint of frustration. His mother wanted blood, but his prey was choosing to hide instead of face him. And that's when he heard Naruto's voice. Oh, you were so close Gara. I think a few bits landed on my coat. Naruto's voice seemed to be coming from everywhere at once, echoing without a specific point of origin. The redhead listened as his mother growled in vexation, the taunting tone Naruto's used causing the sand at Gara's feet to jump in agitation. Sabaku no Gara had never been taunted before, but he was quickly learning that it was something he did not like. Sand suddenly jumped up on the red-headed Jen inside had him turning to see what had tried to strike him, only to whip his head around when another blow was walled off. Deciding to take initiative Gara thrust his hand out, pouring his will into the sand and adding to its power, and then shooting spears of sand from the defensive wall in an attempt to catch the blonde he believed to be there. When that failed Gara finally noticed just how close the attacks were getting before being stopped. His sand was only just able to catch them. This revelation caused his mother's hackles to rise. Who did this worm think they were? Did he not understand who he was dealing with? Well, they just have to show him, wouldn't they? Sand swiftly pulled under Gara's feet before it solidified, and then took to the air. Naruto's brow was furrowed in thought as he pondered what to do next. His summons had informed him that the Keisuke's son had taken to the air, effectively cutting them off, which meant that it was now in the blonde's hands. He'd used the same trio from his match with Ten Ten, using them in another effort to gauge his opponent's strength. Or rather, to discern the capabilities of that sand for himself. And Naruto didn't like what he'd learned. Add to that the fact his opponent was in the air, and Naruto had to wonder if his mist was useless now. Unless. Naruto's scrunched eyebrows jumped to his hairline. That could work. His mind racing, the blonde Jenin thought back to the first exam. Ice mirrors. It was risky, and Naruto doubted he had the skill with elemental combination to make them as big as Haku's but the plan was the best he could think of without taking down his mist. Maybe if I make enough, it'll make up for their small size. Unfortunately the blonde didn't get the chance to set his plan into motion, because he was soon having to avoid being crushed by a dangerous fist of sand. Jumping back, Naruto outwardly cursed while internally wondering how Gara had managed to find him. The answer was not one he'd expected, a floating eyeball. It was the same technique the Uzumaki recalled his adversary using during the written exam. The eye's power quickly became apparent when Naruto found himself leaping and twisting through the air to avoid being caught by Gara's sand. It was clear that, no matter where the red head was, he could see Naruto and direct his attacks according. This was a problem. Deciding his tactic wasn't working like he hoped Naruto set to work cancelling his mist and returning the stadium to normal, but the blonde made sure to activate his stealth jutsu before he was fully exposed. Once the stage was clear again the invisible Naruto could easily find the floating Gara, the red head kneeling on a cloud of sand. Blue eyes watched as that airborne genin used his floating eye as well as his single open eye to try and pinpoint his location. In fact, it almost looked as if Gara could sense him. Knowing that, if such a thing were true, he would lose his element of surprise Naruto opted instead to give his opponent a different target. Using an old trick the blonde's hands formed a cross seal and, out of a cloud of smoke came a shadow clone. The plan worked. Immediately upon the copy's creation Gara's attention turned in its direction. As Gara hurled a twin strike of sand spears at his clone, Naruto took that moment to move away. Watching as his original clone created two of his own Naruto thought of how best to handle Gara and his sentient sand. With his speed the blonde was sure he could close the gap fast enough to land blows, but the worry came in being able to pull away before getting captured afterwards. Which meant separating the red head from his gourd was the first priority. That came easy enough thanks to the young genin's invisibility. Making his way around the floating Gara. Naruto silently pulled a kunai from his thigh holster, and then dashed towards his opponent. Leaping into the air, the cloaked blonde reached out and took hold of the gourd strap while simultaneously moving his knife through the shoulder. The leather strap gave out under the sharp blade and Naruto soon found himself falling to the arena floor, where he proceeded to launch the container across the field. 
blue eyes watched as one of the clones raced after it and engulfed the deadly sand in a large ball of fire. Now the only sand Gara had was what the red head used to keep him afloat. Unfortunately, the calm Naruto felt was quickly wiped away when he watched his opponent work through a chain of hand signs. Earth style, earth flow river. The now visible Naruto watched as his clones were both caught in two separate upsurging pools of mud. The brown sludge quickly swallowed the copies up before they could react, and they dispersed in clouds of smoke. But Gara wasn't done yet. Earth style, earth dragon bullet. Now it was the mod of a dragon, drudging up from within the two pools of pre-prepared mud. Naruto sensed trouble and was proven right when both dragon heads opened their jaws and began sending volleys of compacted mud at him. Using his great speed though Naruto was able to duck and dodge each of the bullets that threatened to shatter his bones. Moving around the field, the black-clad swordsman took a chance and jumped into the air. Skimming by another hail of rocketing projectiles, Naruto swiftly flashed through his own set of hand signs before calling out his jutsu water style, exploding water shockwave. A stone-cutting, pressurized jet of water flew from Naruto's lips. The bone-breaking blast was aimed straight at Gara but, before it could hit the red-headed Genin swerved out of the way. Making a choice to not let his attack go to waste, Naruto turned the jutsu on both dragon heads that had been left waiting for Gara to return his attention to. With the lack of constant chakra flow the technique's elemental advantage wasn't strong enough and soon both mud dragons were shattered and mixed into the deluge that formed after Naruto ceased his own chakra flow. The puddle of water left behind wasn't really enough to make a dragon of its own, but the blonde creator of the pool did decide it could be used for a different technique. Now it was just a matter of timing his jutsu right. Letting Gara chase him around with his next Earth-style jutsu, the same dragons he'd used against Lee Naruto hopped, flipped and dodged to avoid being snagged or slammed by his opponent's impressive display of powerful techniques. It was as he back-flipped away from one particular serpent, letting it smash back into the earth it was made of, that the blonde saw his chance. Wind style minus great a break. Woo woo woo. Naruto's plan was cut short when an alarm every citizen of Konoha knew well blared across the air. A loud explosion, and the frightened screams of people outside was all it took for the shinobi in the stands to realize what they were hearing was no mistake. Konoha was under attack. That's it for this part if you enjoyed it then like, share and subscribe for the next video as it's going to be more interesting, and also check out the other playlist hope you would like them too.